Every step I take, I move my truth. Every time they tell me stop, I use. Every comment, hate that makes my feel gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with. Giving my blood so I am relentless. All right. Well, this is a Keep Hammering Collective with Cole Kramer. Great to have you. Thank you for having me on, sir. I really appreciate it. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I've been a fan of what you do for a long time. Love your attitude. And for those that don't know, Cole's a guide out of Kodiak, Alaska. And what, what do you guide for? Bear, sheep, goats, what else? So, yeah, mainly brown bear, uh, mountain goats, Sitka black-tailed deer, doll sheep. Uh, so kind of travel around the state a little bit. Uh, kind of, you know, if you're going to guide full time, you got to hit the seasons mm-hmm. and uh, travel around a little bit. Uh, we just finished up on the Alaska Peninsula for a brown bear. Then now we're moving over to Kodiak for our brown bear season. So, yeah, kind of just jump around as a as a gypsy guide, kind of, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not like a full time influencer now? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's actually something that pays the bills. That's uh, being a guide. Oh, you know, I think you and I have, you know, the one thing I really like, there's a lot of things I like about you, but the one thing that uh, you've always stayed very humble about yourself, you've had a day job for yeah. a very long time of which, what you just, just got yeah, out of what, was, what this last year or it was something? a year ago. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's like, you know, this is all fun and and fine and dandy, but uh, realistically, I'm a guide. Yeah. And that's, it, you know, at the end of the day, uh, uh, sponsors and working with companies could all go away. At the end of the day, I'm still a guide. That's I all know. I'm ever going to be. Yeah. So that that's the way I look at things. And, uh, you know, if if, uh, if we can help some people along the way, um, getting into hunting and understanding things uh, out there, then, you know, then it's they're great. Yes, yeah. it's a bonus. That's what I always thought too. It's like, I got to keep this job because hunting is what I love, you know? And if I have to get in a position where I make a decision on a sponsor or this or that because of money, it's like, I don't really care. Yeah. I have a job. I don't have to do, I don't have to do what you say. I don't have yep. to do something I don't want to do. I have a job that pays the bills. So it's, uh, that's, that's nice because I don't, I mean, and I'm like you, I'm sure that I don't want business to interfere with what I love Mm -hmm. and you love guiding you love being on the field and of course there's business to what we do but still the passion is what got us there yeah and a hundred percent yeah it's uh yeah guiding and taking people out hunting is has kind of been my thing ever since I was a kid you know Mm -hmm. I always really enjoyed doing it sure I love hunting for myself but it almost now it's kind of a weird feeling when I'm the one you know, pulling back the bow or, or pulling the trigger on the gun. It's, it's almost kind of a weird feeling, <laughs> you know, like I, I almost feel selfish, Yeah. you know, because I'm like, oh man, someone else could have had this uh, pretty yeah. cool experience. But I realize it's also helped me become a better guide because there's a lot of guides who don't take the time to go hunting for themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're just strictly guides. And I think it really will help you become a better guide if if you yourself, especially going on hunts that you have to pay for, mm-hmm. because you don't know what that client or person is feeling when they've paid you their hard-earned money yeah. until you have put forth your hard-earned money. And then at the end, whether you've gotten an animal or not, having to tip your guide, yeah. you know, walking away from a hunt, not getting something, yeah, you know, that can, you know, it's good to know what that feels like. <laughs> and there's a lot of people that have not done that before. And it doesn't matter the scale of it. It could be right. a $3,500 hunt. It could be a $35,000 hunt. Mm-hmm. But it's nice to know both sides of that for, for a guide. That's for sure. I think it's a... a- the crux of any hunt is that decision in, in the red zone when you're getting ready to shoot. And I think it's important because you can get somebody there or somebody can get there, but until you're actually sending that arrow or that bullet, it's there's a lot of decisions up to that point, but that, the decisions right then, I think you can you can learn from as a guide Mm -hmm. when you're doing it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, that's such a critical time. So if you know, because you've done it yourself many times Mm -hmm. and you've been the, you know, as you said, a paying client. So you know how that kind of pressure feels. I, I agree. I think it, it has to help. You know, I think a guide who never kills or is never in that situation where they're paying for it, 
I think it's like they're a step below where you are because you've you know what those emotions are like. Mm-hmm. You know everything because we're humans. We got so many things that come in our head, in and out, weigh on us, different things. And it's like, I I, I love your approach about still hunting, still going on hunts, but in in with the goal of helping your job as a guide. Mm-hmm. I think it's important. Yeah, it's it's really, really easy for a guide to get worked up <laughs> with this hunter for not being able to make the shot or get ready, get ready, get ready and not take the shot. And they sit there and kind of bad mouth the hunter. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, years ago, um, especially with archery, because I've specialized in archery for many years because I grew up shooting a bow and, and, um, you know, um, if you don't know archery, then it, you just get someone within a hundred yards. You're like, mm-hmm. okay, well, there it is. There it is. Take your shot. Yeah. And it's like, oh no. It, whereas like a, a true bow hunter will understand that we could be at 10 yards or five mm-hmm. yards. I've had guys full drawn on a bear at five yards and not get a shot. Mm-hmm. And you know, you've got to have the willingness to let down and not take a bad shot. Right. You know, it's not worth it. Not worth wounding an animal. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things, but to also have, some sympathy for a guy who just, I didn't feel comfortable f- with the shot because I've been in those situations too, where a guy's yelling at me to shoot, 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 shoot. And <laughs> I'm like, man, I didn't feel comfortable with the shot. And mm. I don't want to wound this thing. It doesn't yeah. matter with a bow or a rifle. Right. It's the same thing. Yeah. You know, you want to make a good ethical shot, uh, or at least in my eyes. And I know in your eyes too. And so, um, I found it really <laughs> pretty funny. Uh, a few years back, I went down to a little, uh, shooting clinic put uh, that this ranch FTW in Texas put on and at the end of it they put us through like a stress course and it was all outfitters mm. okay there was like 15 of us guides there yeah okay and these are seasoned older outfitters from the US but also Europe Africa you know yeah. several places it was right before Dallas Safari Club right so it was like an invite thing and at the end they said okay so here's the deal you're gonna shoot at a target at uh, 150 or 200 yards, we'll tell you the target, and then you'll have 10 seconds to engage this next target. It would be like a fleeing animal. Mm-hmm. It's wounded or you missed, right. and you'd have to hit the other target. And they said, and we're going to pressure you. And they're like, okay, yep, yep, okay. We, we know what's coming. Right. And almost every single one of those guys, they said, okay, time starts when you shoot, boom. Hurry up, shoot, reload, hurry, hurry, hurry. And <laughs> almost every single one of those guys stopped what they were doing, looked back and said, hey, man, shut up. <laughs> and, and they all, it's yeah. like, well, you lose. <laughs> <laughs> they literally do the yeah. same thing to their client, all but the they would have happened to them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they failed. So it's like, hey, if you don't understand what it's like, like right. no one likes being yelled at. So you right. got to know how to... Uh, defuse those situations and or talk to you. It's okay. Reload. Uh, mm. Let's get ready for another shot just in case. And uh, so it's always very interesting um, uh, in those situations, how I people bet. react and uh, having a little sympathy for someone who's, you know, worked up. Cause that's the other thing, um, especially being around bears, you just never really know how you're going to react. Right. You have been around a lot of bears and you know how you react. Mm-hmm. Most people never know that feeling yeah and uh until it's that time and i've seen some guys that i've judged that first like you know judge the cover of uh, this guy's probably not gonna hold it together right. and then that guy did great and then mm-hmm. the next guy you thought yeah he'll do great then that guy freaked out <laughs> you know so yeah. but that's just part of it. it's part of our job yeah. to be able to uh, calm those guys mm-hmm. um and to do that and you know uh what i was going to say earlier is you know years back i with bow hunting there was, there was a lot of failure that we went through, mm. um, whether it be with setups, not knowing uh, the types of setups uh, that would be best for large, large brown bears. Mm-hmm. And um, things just happened, like weird circumstances, mm-hmm. uh, not good penetration or, or bears reacting differently. And, it, you know, but I always just kind of put it on the, I'm like, well, we got him in there. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's his fault. Yeah. And, Shot opportunity, 100%. Yep. Yep. <laughs> his fault, his fault, his yeah. fault. Then I thought, you know this really isn't the right way to go about this. I mean, I felt like, cause the other thing is, um, being a young guide, mm-hmm. uh, cause I started when I was 19 and in my, you know, 
Are you 25 now? <laughs> Do you not see this gray hair? Now, <laughs> I dye this, just so you know, just to look more, uh, you know, mature. All right. Uh, but, uh, no, um, but, yeah, so in my early 20s, uh, the, these guys, uh, you know, I would just say it's their fault, it's their fault, and I didn't want to step on their toes by trying to remind them mm -hmm. steps. And I thought, you know, after all, so lots of failure mm -hmm. and um, some, you know, close calls on things. It was, uh, I thought, you know, I, I don't, I'm just going to address this and try to work on myself and to address it right off the bat and say, you know, I just want to tell you, um, I'm going to remind you of some things. And if there's some things that you would like to hear mm -hmm. to remind you, please let me know right. throughout the hunt because uh, it will help. And I don't want you to think that, uh, that you don't know this. I'm just trying to remind you these steps yeah. because in these high stakes situations, people will forget mm -hmm. because I know I have forgotten as a hunter, as a bow yeah. hunter, and we go, dang it. And, yeah. and with a large animal in front of you at five, 10 yards, uh, I've, I've seen some interesting things with humans happen and you have to learn how to break them out of that. Like and what keep would the them, re reminders be? Um, just, just keeping them like in their steps mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, draw. Cause most of the times when a, when a bear would be getting ready to come out of the brush, I'm paying attention. I'm having them down low behind a bush or on the side of the bush. Mm -hmm. And to, in order for the bear not to see the movement, I would say, okay, get ready to draw draw and so they would draw and i just remind them about set you know your anchor point mm -hmm. watch your bubble yeah you know like all those little steps yeah, and if yeah. they had something like tell me don't punch it you know, right like uh, just focus pick a hair those big animals as you know mm -hmm. i mean it's it doesn't matter probably with elk moose bear large animals it's yeah. almost like your brain is just like just put the pins on it you know right. but a lot of guys will shoot high mm -hmm. you know or or something of that nature and they yeah. kind of just forget yeah and a lot of people will say i man, i don't even know i just put the pins on them mm -hmm. you know i had a guy uh one time bear at five yards five, six, okay, maybe I was exaggerating, six yards. Uh, <laughs> it uh, it came out of the water, it was perfectly broadside at, at uh, six yards, very large bear, and the guy pulled back with his recurve, and the bear turned to look at him, and he in instinctively moved the bow to the bear's face and released. That was yeah. a, that's like a five foot swing yeah. with your bow. Yeah, because he was, he was looking at the he head. Was, yep, he just went, the bear looked at him, he goes, oh, and yeah. shot and uh God. did he hit it oh yeah yeah um the bear ran out about 50 yards and was slightly upset uh with with the with this thing protruding from his head so uh, i handed him the rifle and he finished him off yeah but uh that would have i believe that would have been the world record at the time with the recurve and that was like in the early Oh, I can't recall when he hunted with us, 2008, 10, somewhere in there. So, I, you, but, Could you have got him closer, though? I mean, it seems like it's on you a little bit. I, I'm working a lot harder on that. Um, <laughs> you know, we, 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 we try not, I mean, here's the thing. It's not like we're trying to get that close, but like, you know, in the fall time, especially when the bears are on fish. Yeah. Okay, they're, they're moving back and forth. So mm -hmm. what we'll say is, okay, we'll be five yards off the creek or 10 yards off the creek, mm -hmm. and um, the creek may be... 10, 15, 20 yards wide, depending on where we're ambushing or going down. And it's it's just a, a matter of, hey, the bear is going to walk after a fish over here or chase a fish, because I've had to be on the opposite side of fish, you know, uh, swirls in the water right yeah. in front of us and bears just running at us. And I was yeah. like, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, and he grabs the fish right directly in front of us. And of course, that stirs up the hunter a little yeah, bit. Of course. And so now you have a five yard yeah. shot of yeah. where you had a 20 yard shot yeah. before of which uh, if I could, if I could, uh, you know, uh, set it every time to be perfect. I mean, 20 yards is, is mm -hmm. a nice shot for That's everyone. A good shot. 15 yeah. yards is yeah. nice closer mm -hmm. we're not trying to get that close it <laughs> is close. it just happens yeah um it just happens sometimes and, when and you can hear him breathing and like oh man that's intense yeah i bet yeah and i mean you've taken several bears so mm -hmm. you you know what it's like to be to be close yeah they're big big incredible um intimidating animals yeah especially that close yeah and and most of the time when you hear bears 
you know, charging someone or whatnot. It's it's kind of like they're just trying to get out of there, mm-hmm. and you just so happen to be in their in way. The, in the way, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that's intense. Um, on you were just on the peninsula. So are they mm-hmm. on are they on fish right now, or what are they on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Fish and berries. Mm. So depending on where you're hunting, you know. Just like on Kodiak, it's some areas have good fish, some mm-hmm. areas don't really have good fish left. Mm-hmm. And so the bears are still, you know, roaming the creeks. It was a mixture of bears eating rotten, dead um, pink salmon, you know, mm-hmm. humpies uh, on the sides that were just nasty. And you'd see sows with cubs and the cubs are just feeding on those rotten carcasses. <laughs> but then they're also catching uh, other silvers that are mm-hmm. still very much alive, colored up but very much alive. Mm-hmm. But then sometimes they'll go out into the berry flats and that tundra and just, you know. Is it a salmon berry? Or? Um, it's just like some of those tundra tundra berries, mm-hmm. like little crow berries. Yeah. There are there are still a few salmon berries here mm-hmm. and there and some low bush ones, but um, it's just a mixture of different types of, of berries. And yeah. And they were also eating, there's like some really uh, green grass along the banks as well. And those bears would... You know, they'll eat a mixture of everything. Yeah. Right? So they need to they're, eat they're just trying to all the time. Yeah. We had we had one bear that we were watching, we called pork chop, and this thing was so, so fat. And I wish, mm. I wish I had a really good uh, you know, uh video or, or, or photo of it through the spotting scope because it you know the national parks or whatever it is does that uh, fat bear week or something yeah. and it would have it, it would have <laughs> done very well and at first i thought it was a de- you know a decent boar by the nets too too roly poly too short yeah. you know stocky but it just had so much fat the belly was on the ground but the, you know it's like man how come that bear was so either was so smart and in mm-hmm. a very good fisher fisherman that uh, or berry clicker or whatever but it was way fatter than the rest of them but uh, is it a sow it was a sow yeah. yep yep okay. i watched it for a long time and i said yeah that that it's a sow it's got to be and actually the bear we end up uh killing was chasing after that bear mm-hmm. and was running after it in the tundra for almost a mile really and but pork chop was about it was 500 yards ahead of it because it was just on its trail. Mm-hmm. And then, then we ended up intercepting it and, um, and just getting the other bear. Was that a good bear? Yeah. 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 Right around nine and a half foot. Good oh, boar. Good. Yeah. Beautiful hide. Yeah. Just gorgeous, gorgeous bear. So, yeah, we were pretty, pretty excited. And uh, weather was pretty brutal on us there for a while. But, really? yeah, we're, you know, it's it's the Alaska Peninsula. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, I mean... When you look at your, I'm looking at my Garmin inReach weather, and it says like clear skies, northwest winds, nice, and it's still raining and blowing, <laughs> snowing every day. Yeah. But that's just the way it is yeah. when you're when you're down there and you on have the ocean. when you're on the ocean, both mm-hmm. sides of the peninsula is hitting you. It, it's rough. It the weather changes constantly. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because the hunters like if it clears up, oh, you think it'll be good today? It's like man. I, I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it could change in five, 10 yeah, minutes. I don't really know. You know, yeah. uh, we moved another guide into my, um, into my camp afterwards and he got stuck in there multiple days after, mm. after they killed a bear, uh, just due to the wrong winds and yeah. fog and rain. And just, did they land on the beach there? Or? Nope. Nope. Just a super cub way up in a valley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah it's kind of we don't have a lot of spots that are like easy to get into. It's yeah. it's pretty uh, advanced super cub flying. So like tundra tires. Yep. Yeah. Big thirty fives. Guys are running, and it's like one of those things that the weather's perfect, mm-hmm. easy. Yeah. But if it starts going the other way, it's you got to know what you're doing. Otherwise, it can it can turn south real real quickly. And I bet um, you know the hunters and you know my hunter was great and everything, but his buddy was out there and they had a big business uh, dealing to deal with this week i think today and hey could you uh could you talk with the outfitter to make sure it gets them out you know <laughs> like kind of quicker to yeah. make sure and i said um and i just called him and said hey man i'm just gonna break it down for you we don't pressure the pilots yeah i've had you know several pilot friends including my uncle die in plane crashes mm-hmm. you don't pressure the pilot no we don't care about your business dealings we care about your safety yeah that is the utmost importance for us and also i'm pretty sure your family you know wants you to come back right. safely so there is no um yeah there's no risking we don't we don't want to risk mm-hmm. you know that uh it, it, 
you know, unless it's absolutely necessary. And yeah. most of the time, I mean, we take in tons of extra food and fuel. You're good for days. There'll yeah. be a break. Right. You know, it's just a matter of being smart because uh, every year you hear planes going down. I know. And, and, and a lot of them are amazing, amazing pilots, you know, and things well, happen. I Jim just this year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I hate that. Um, I flew with Jim multiple times. I mm -hmm. went out there and hunted those guys. Shane was a very close friend of mine as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, he, he's the best of the best. Uh, you know, Jim is yeah. – I'd fly with that guy. If he would have balled that plane up and walked away from I'd hop right in a plane with him right after that. That guy is an amazing pilot, an amazing family. And, and uh, yeah, my heart goes out to those guys. That's terrible. You know? Yep. But uh, it's just, um, you know – Alaska is, is, uh, there's a lot of things that can happen yeah. on the ground or in the air. Mm -hmm. And that's just, uh, you know, as you know, with your buddy Roy, I mean, that's just, it's a very unfortunate thing. And, um, you just got to try to be as safe as you can yeah. out there, but there's still risk no matter what always. you're doing. There's always risk. But my yeah. thing is, and I think we're probably on the same page as, you know, our families don't want to see us go and probably in such a way, but I worry more and I would be way more upset dying in a car crash with some 17 year old girl texting and running into yeah. me, running me over while I'm on a run or something that, you know, then, then, uh, you know, bear eating me or falling off the mountain or plane crash, you know, at least I'm doing something that I absolutely love. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just the unfortunate thing is your, your family, you yeah. know, that you leave behind. But, uh, but yeah, I worry more in town. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's what I have way more worries about. Me too. And, uh, the than uncontrollable in town. Yep. Yeah, I mean it's yeah because at least being out in the wild, yes, there's risks. We're we're well aware of them, but and it's not like you're in control, but you're more at peace out there. Yeah, and it's, you feel like if it's if it happens out there, that's what you signed up for. Mm -hmm. You know, if it happens in town doing something, it's like God. You're just a, a pawn, basically. You yeah. have no control over it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, I, I think we all we all hope to someday be, you know, just sitting there on the on an easy chair with grandkids or great grandkids and telling stories of, of hunting adventures. Yeah. You know, that's the that is the ultimate goal, you know, and uh, and to, you know, pass gracefully and mm -hmm. without uh, horrible suffering suffering yeah you know yeah doesn't always work that way how what happened to your uncle uh so my uncle uh robin starrett uh he was in the coast guard mm. uh flew i think 25 years in the coast guard lieutenant commander uh flew h60s um essentially like a black hawk but they call him a jayhawk and uh so he did that and retired and then he was flying uh fixed wing uh, flying a Navajo and actually ended up having a catastrophic failure after takeoff in Man. really bad weather in January, right off takeoff, fully loaded with stuff and just, you know, right off the end of the Kodiak runway, very unfortunate mm -hmm. deal. And, but, uh, you know, he was a huge influence in my life. Uh, he's the reason why I went up to Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, when my parents divorced when I was 11, uh, my uncle, you know, wanted to get us out of there and just uh, my mom was actually moving from kansas to missouri to our new home and thought eh, i'm gonna bring the kids up get them out of that situation mm -hmm. while she's moving and uh brought us up to alaska you know fishing for two weeks solid it was just unbelievable un freaking believable <laughs> and, and of course it was like during like pink salmon season oh, so it's like every cast you're catching, catching fish <laughs> and i was a kid that caught bluegill bass crappie <laughs> yeah, you know that are just things. yeah and i freaked out if i caught a you know one two pound two pound bass yeah you know and so like <laughs> for catching five to ten pound pink salmon yeah i mean it it just blew me away i'm like well back. i'm coming back here and i was 11 at the time and i'd already been uh pretty uh i would say 
I was always a young entrepreneur <laughs> <laughs> of like, hmm, I need to make money. How do I do this? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll shovel driveways, snow in the winter yeah. time. Um, you know, mow lawns. I loved mowing, mowing and vacuuming. For some reason, I like vacuuming <laughs> in the house because it was like, like mowing. I could indoor mow. Indoor mowing. Uh, yeah, indoor mowing. I could do lines. <laughs> And I think I was like ADD. Luckily, my parents never gave me any meds. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I say luckily that maybe it wasn't luckily for them. But like, I think doing those things kept my mind. Yeah. Mind numbing. Right. You know. Right. Uh, okay. Shoveling. Yeah. It's shoveling pretty snow. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. I like digging holes in the backyard. I just go dig a hole. You know. Yeah. And uh, shoot my bow. Don't overthink it. No. No. <laughs> and uh, but when I got back from Alaska. I was like, okay, I have to go back. And they're like, well, that's, that's pretty expensive, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, okay, well, what do I need to do? And they're like, well, uh, you know, you just, you know, it's just hard to, s you got to work, I guess, or do your chores. And I was like, okay, so all my chore money, all my work money, birthdays, Christmas, all needs to go to Alaska Fund. <laughs> and so that's kind of, that's where that went. And luckily I was able to go up to Alaska a few more times before I end up moving up there ap right after high school, mm. a week after high school. But, uh, yeah, my uncle had a short stint where he got, uh, transferred to Cape Cod and then for like nine months and he got transferred back to Kodiak cause they needed more helicopter pilots back up there and he loved it up there. So, uh, he drove through and picked me up and we did a two week trip where we pretty much camped the whole, whole time, mm. uh, stopped in like Libby, Montana. That's where I learned how to fly fish on the Kootenai river. It was nice. like, I want to say it was the year or two after A River Runs Through It came out. Oh, man. And so I was Prime like, time. oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I was there trying to do like the Brad Pitt casting, yeah. you know, whatever it was, the butterfly. I don't know I what know. it was called. <laughs> it looked good, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I made like the yearbook. You know, I was in the yearbook fly fishing. Oh, you know? sick. So, but that's where I learned how to fly fish. You know, it's just uh, those those memories that my uncle yeah. gave me were like the most amazing things and, uh, you know, driving up up through Canada, camping basically every night. Uh, lots of fun. Oh, I bet. Lots of good adventure. Um, and I mean, as you know, when was the first time you went to Alaska? Um, in the nineties, I think Kodiak, me and Roy did Kodiak. I think it was 96, maybe 94, something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm sure for you, same thing. You just get through like, Oh man. Oh was, yeah. Heaven. It was heaven. Go kill three or four deer. <laughs> I mean, I had a hard time that first one because I had, I was like, and you go, you go into a hunt and say, okay, I got four deer tags. It's like, I'm going to kill four big bucks. It's like, you can't kill four until you can kill one. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and then I skipped the one and was like, I already had these big plans. So I had a hard time killing the one, but then finally I did kill two on that first hunt. Meanwhile, Roy was killing just giants with his recurve and like, he, <laughs> like he always, he's always beating me on the big animals, but yeah. It was like heaven on earth up there for, for a hunter. Yeah. You know, there's no, no greater place to go than Alaska. It's just so, it's big and grand. You know, it's yeah. uh, the grandiose just views. And when you get out there and that plane leaves. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a different. real deal. It's, di <laughs> it's every deal. step is, is crucial. Yeah. And you got to, you got to know what you're doing. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's, it, it's just one of those things and it can, and it can imprint your soul or uh, or you'll give you major anxiety and you'll never come back either love or hate it <laughs> yeah i mean it's either oh, like yeah. this is everything i've ever wanted to do or it's just too much for some people there's some people that it's yeah. too much and it happens even on guided hunts yeah. i've had a handful of guys over the years that just said this isn't what i signed up for and it's mm -hmm. like what what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like you thought we were going to kill way earlier, but it was what it was is they were, it, it freaked them out too much out there. Yeah. The camping, uh, being out there that far away, they just couldn't get in their truck and, and like they had no service. Right. You know? Um, and so it freaks people out. Yeah. And even, even to this day, there's, I mean, not that that ever goes away. It's been, you know, been like that way forever, but in terms of, you know, my goals are to get people out there, have a great hunt, but also the big one is to for freaking for people to detach. Yeah. Put your freaking phone down, man. Mm -hmm. You don't have service out here. Yeah. You know, and you know, for a business standpoint and for family, mainly family and safety, you know, like your in reach is is it's nice mm -hmm. to be able to 
touch base, let your wife know, your kids know we're, we're okay. Yeah. You know, um, things of that nature. If you have to, fine, check in with business. Cabela's and Bass Pro Shops is a sponsor of the podcast. And that's especially powerful for me because I remember when Cabela's came to town, came to Springfield, Oregon, and I actually played a role in the opening of that store. Instead of cutting the grand opening ribbon with scissors, I shot it with an arrow. And it was just a monumental thing. I mean, everybody here in town was talking about, hey, are you going to go to Cabela's? Can you believe Cabela's is coming here to Springfield, Oregon? So I know what a staple those giants in the industry are. And it's actually, it's one of the first places people go when they're looking to get geared up to be to become a hunter is they go to Cabela's and buy everything they need. So I'm very excited that we've partnered together and we can help open up those outdoor and hunting opportunities to listeners of this podcast. Hey guys, looking to take your wellness to the next level? Blokes can help you. They are a modern health optimization service for men that is devoted to your physical, sexual, and mental health. From the convenience of your home, Blokes helps you test your hormones, consult with a board-certified clinician about your results, and receive a personalized plan and treatment specifically for you. Blokes' mission is to optimize men from the inside out. Patients come to them feeling old, tired, overweight, and like things aren't what they used to be. Blokes wants to help get that pet back in their step. Blokes improves men's lives by optimizing their hormones, the most essential chemical messengers in the body. Blokes is going to send someone to my house to draw my blood. No appointment was required, and I'm really excited to be partnering with them so I can keep hammering for another day. They're offering you guys 20% off labs if you use code CAM at blokes.co slash CAM. You don't have to be like texting all your buddies, giving updates every moment of every, you know, because, I mean, it's different when you're hunting somewhere and you've got service and this Mm -hmm. and that and the other, whatever. Or it's like a, you know, pretty boring, dull hunt. But, man, it's it's really, I really enjoy watching people detach for 10 days, 15 days. Yeah. And you just see the new spark in their eyes of, hey, man. Every day we're just getting up, we're yeah. making coffee in the morning, we're making breakfast, we're getting up on the hill. It's a simple life out it's here. It's pure. It's very pure. Yeah. And we're watching the animals. Uh, we've got nothing but time, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, it's really, really cool to see that. Um, you know, when, when you went on that Black Rifle uh, podcast with those guys, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and you got to hear Evan and all those guys bear hunt story, but like that was actually really cool to see those guys who were obviously very content, you know, rich yeah. people that do lots of, uh, lots of content. Um, and so uh, to watch them finally detach and not check their phone, like, yeah. Oh yeah, I don't have service. I can't look at Instagram or, <laughs> or something, you know, and I love those guys, but it, like finally after about four or five days, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, that's gone, and then watching some of the guys like Logan write in his in his uh, in his notebook skits and different things, and just just making notes and you know yeah, that, that's cool. I know. You know, and and then you know all that stuff comes to fruition later on. Yeah, well, but they, but like I got to watch those guys. You know, ten days in, like man, we need this. Mm-hmm. We got to do this every year. We yeah. got to detach because it's it when you're in town and in service and we don't really we don't really understand how much uh, this you know like the phone and just being connected with people you know it's great but we have to do it for business and this and that but man it's truly amazing when you can set all that stuff aside and reboot your system it is a reboot for your system you don't know what you're missing yeah. And it's like, we think we're missing something by not having the connection. You're actually missing something by not having the connection with the land mm-hmm. and the animals and yeah. yourself, basically. Yeah. Yep. And that's, so that's a real connection. This stuff is like, anybody has this. Yeah. Out in the, in the mountains or in the wilderness, it's like, <clears throat> that's what very few people have nowadays. Mm-hmm. That's the special part. Yeah. You know, and just. <clears throat> just surviving, looking for animals, trying to make a plan, just being with just the, the true human interactions, you know, with another man. It's like, that's what's, that's a reward to it. Getting to know a person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, getting to know your guides, uh, my relationships with some of my hunters or some of my best 
friendships now. Mm -hmm. And uh, those guys, I've had guys, you know, that either don't have sons that hunt or don't have kids or, or a son or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I feel very blessed that, that there's, you know, a handful of those guys that treat me like a son and, you know, for holidays and, or this and that. And if I don't stop through and see them, I'm down in the States. Yeah. It's not good. (laughs) They're not happy. Their wives are calling me. Hey, they're not, they're not really happy with you that you didn't come by while you're in town. It's like, oh, geez, you know, and so you make those relationships and those are special, Yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, in our hunts, like our bear hunts, I mean, hey, what's our goal? We're going to, our goal is obviously find a large mature boar mm-hmm. and to kill that thing and for you to uh, be successful in that hunt. But realistically, my goal is to show you and teach you things about bears in the land that we're in. Mm -hmm. And it is a huge bear viewing trip. Right. Right. Nature viewing trip. Yeah. (laughs) We're getting to watch a lot of cool stuff. And that's the whole thing. When guys are immersed in their phones, they're missing that. Yeah, exactly. And glassing is such a big thing. Mm -hmm. And we're in our binos all the time. And, but I'm also, it's also like, we're talking, but that goes by the wayside after a few days of getting to know the person and going over everything. And some, you know, the other times you're kind of split up on the hill and then you're, I basically put all my clothing on if, especially if it's cold and blowing and just kind of, uh, sit there and just think about life and going over things in my brain and, you know, being in my own brain. Mm-hmm. Because when people are constantly, you know, listening to, you know, whether it be music or uh, podcasts or which always listen to this one for sure. But like <laughs> the point is some people don't know how to just be yeah. in their own brain. Right. In, yeah. in their own thoughts. Right. And it, so that is an interesting thing. I, I say that those are important things, especially if you've never done it, and that's mm-hmm. a great place to do it. But it also is when I've got to dig deep and be like really trying to find bears like in the afternoon and or whatnot on my hunts, I, I tell guys, whatever you got to do to stay in the game, you mm-hmm. must be present to win on mm-hmm. these hunts. And I need you to be glassing and especially my guides, if we're out there, it's like, if you get, you know, I'll have one earbud in, listen to an audio book or a podcast or some music. If mm-hmm. I got, I mean, especially when you're getting tired and whatnot, yeah. I'll take my little cat nap, replenish <laughs> my eyes. And, uh, and when I wake up, it's ready to rock and roll, mm-hmm. you know, because if you don't, especially in those long spring days, mm-hmm. you don't take a little little nap. And, and it's almost like sometimes they don't even fall asleep, but like for 30 minutes, you have your eyes closed. Yeah. Give in a, a tundra break. hole, yeah, and you wake up, and really often it's pretty amazing. You're like, oh, there's a bear, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But your eyes are just, you know, they're just getting beat up by just constantly looking through the glass, and you got to have the best glass to do it, you know. And but uh, what do you use? I use a mixture of stuff, typically a Swaro binos. I've got a set of loophole binos. Got some Sig ones. You know, it's like there's, I don't know, it's just a mixture. Yeah, but. I, I have been using instead of these loopholes for a while for my binos. It's pretty no nice. Spotting scope. Spotting scopes. I use that 95 millimeter Swaro. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, but I also bought that baby Swaro. Oh, okay. It's yeah. It's pretty nice. <laughs> it's pretty nice. You go yeah. from the 95 down to that little <laughs> yeah. tiny one. It's, I bet. Uh, yeah, what's, it's, your, what's your favorite animal to hunt? You like bears or sheep? I or? mean, I mean, I guess I have to say bears, Yeah, you know, but they're all fun. Yeah. The, you know what I mean? It's like when you're watching the blacktail rut and you're in the height of that blacktail rut. Yeah, it's tough to beat that. It is so much fun. Yeah. I love mountain goats for how mm-hmm. cocky they are yeah. and like the steep, nasty terrain that they get in. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're beautiful, you know, uh, big, white, wavy coats, you know, uh they are, they're beasts, man. Yeah. And, um, but sheep are obviously very majestic, but they also give me probably the most stress. Really? I put the most stress on myself, sheep hunting. How come? Um, because it's very physical, very, very physical for guys. Not, it, I'm not saying physical for myself. It's physical, sure. But mm-hmm. a, it's physical for a lot of the hunters that yeah. we're taking. It's very physical. 
And um, same thing with goats, but in terms of sheep are so scared. Yeah. They're scared. Yeah. And they see something. Goats are very uh, planned out. Here is our goat trail. We will evacuate the area down this trail Mm -hmm. and we will go here and you could, you could plan on that. That's what they're going to do. You literally could have a guy sitting there on the trail and they (laughs) will walk out that trail, you know? And so, but sheep, I mean, sometimes they may go on a trail, but otherwise they're just running out of there. Yeah. And I've watched bands of rams, you know, one of them probably fart and they jump up and they run (laughs) for 500 to a yards to a mile yeah for no reason Mm -hmm. no reason at all or get up in the goat rocks and it's like yep couldn't do anything yep and so sheep what i do typically and this is me myself and i i i have a camp in my back at all times Mm -hmm. and i will not as soon as i find the ram he does not leave my sight the only time he's not in my sight is if it's dark yeah and uh, i try to camp right over a ridge right over a mound do something where i can get up and just look mm-hmm. and make sure I keep an eye on them. Yeah. And, uh, cause some of these areas, you know, sure you could find some spots that have a lot of different Rams in there, but it, you know, when you're, when you're hunting the areas where it's eight year old Ram full curl or boomed on both sides, you know, sometimes you're just not finding as many, excuse me, um, legal Rams yeah. always. And yeah. when you do find a legal Ram, you better, or better one that you it. really want, you better yeah. stick with them. Yeah. There's some guys I know that, oh, it's long days and, you know, I just get up whenever and go after them. That's not the way I hunt sheep, man. Mm-hmm. And so I, you know, if anything, during the day while they're bedded, it's sunny, you know, uh, me and my hunter, if you got to take a little cat nap, yeah, take a little cat nap, mm-hmm. you know, during when the sun's up and it's, uh, you know, you could see them. Yeah. And I can disappear uh, but on I am, I am on them till dark Yeah, <laughs> and I wake up in the morning, I'm rolling over and I'm looking, okay, he's still there. Right. Um, that's just kind of what I like doing. And sometimes you got to make big move when that downdrafts are in the morning, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the night, you may have to get up really early and make a move up that, up into that bowl, um, while those, uh, air currents aren't coming up towards them, you know, cause some of the stuff, like, especially in the Chugach, you can't just jump on a ridge and walk around the ridge and, and go over there. It may not be passable, yeah. you know? Uh, so it's just, I love sheep hunting. Um, we went to Northwest territories this year, um, did a, did a fabulous sheep hunt there. That was my first time to I go there. the McKenzie mountain reference. Oh, and yeah. 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 It was beautiful. We were over there at Canola Outfitters and, uh, took my buddy Jonathan Blank and um, from Salt Lake, and uh, that was that was a lot of fun. We had a really so really. Did good you time. work for Canola Outfitters? I was strictly there as a packer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, just helping out. Yep, we had yeah. our guide from there, uh, buddy Cash was guiding, and um, and so I was strictly there to. You didn't say a word. <laughs> I didn't need to. Yeah, I didn't need to because uh, he's a good guide. You know, yeah. it was actually very. The, my only stress, so we're taking Jonathan. Jonathan's a double amputee, uh, mm. Marine, and, you know, great guy. And uh, took him goat hunting last year, ended up drawing a goat tag, got him up on the mountain with a good team of guys, uh, killed a mountain goat, mm. and um, really cool experience. And then brought him down to Wild Sheep Convention because they were showing like a, uh, a little short of the hunt mm-hmm. um, one of the evenings and got him you know introduced to several of the people there and uh there was a really um great generous family there that said yeah you should probably go sheep hunting Hmm. and uh, they came to me and said we'd like to donate our sheep hunt to them and i mean it it floored me it you know i was in tears first thing in the morning when the guy's um, daughter came up and told me about that and so um saturday night banquet you know, you got over a thousand people in the room. They had Jonathan come up there and, and uh, Gray Thornton, the president, said, well, you ready to go sheep hunting? <laughs> and so uh, it was really cool and um, really neat, emotional uh, time. Um, and uh, we, so we uh, went up there end of August this year and uh, got him up there. And first day, uh, able to get him a giant mountain caribou. Wow. And, uh and then the second day, ended up shooting a ram, and we were out of there the third day. I mean, it happened so fast wow, for us. That's incredible. Because we got into camp, and there were guys that had been in there 10 days. 
and <laughs> and so I had John on the um, on my pack I built, and we're just kind of doing a little few warm up things on the um, runway, and these guys get in, and they're kind of like, like, yeah, what is this? How much does he weigh? <laughs> John weighs, he says 135. I think he gained a little weight on this hunt, but I'm just kidding, John. <laughs> but uh, no, he's what, about 135. Yeah. Um, and then so, but uh, yeah, these guys were like, what are you guys going to do? It's like, <laughs> oh, we're going to go sheep hunting. And, and, you know, it's like my thing is like it's just, yeah, it may take us 10 days, yeah. but whatever, one step at a time. And mm-hmm. we're not going to go fast. It's just uh, we take our time, take it in, and, uh, you know, you assemble a good team of guys and um, just – get the job done, yeah. you know, but, yeah. uh, yeah, I think it was like, we had a lot of people praying for us mm-hmm. and, um, I, that's my, I never pray for, Hey, I, you know, Lord, let us go kill something. Mm-hmm. I just pray for strength, wisdom, and courage to do the right things mm-hmm. and to have a good outcome and to, you know, hopefully inspire others to get out there to do things for others. And especially like in our military with those guys, getting them back out in the field, um, and, and showing them that you can, you know, still be a part of these adventures, especially these guys that are affected majorly by war. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it's pretty cool for myself. Uh, The good Lord has blessed me with, I guess, a little bit of strength (laughs) to, uh, just walk with a heavier pack on. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really, you know, it's my way to be able to get guys out there. And one of the cool things that we found out like last year, because um, my buddy um, Kevin Dana owns Barney's in Anchorage. You've probably been in that shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he kind of helped me with the pack frame, and then another uh, uh, custom seamstress uh, worked on some things um, through like the Sitka Custom Shop. They uh, a lot of we had calls afterwards from fathers wanting to take their sons out. And daughters mm-hmm. that were paralyzed. I see. Yeah, and that was the majority of calls. Really, were were uh, parents wanting to get their kids out, mm. and we're like, "Wow, that's incredible. That's cool. Yeah, it is. That's cool. How that? And how that? How did he ride on your pack? Was it pretty really good? good yeah. yeah, honestly, because there's a meat shelf on the back of those yeah. pack frames, and um, the problem was the meat shelf. I found out. Uh, when you first get on it, it wants to come in. So yeah. you'd set that quarter on there, mm-hmm. right? And then it, it, it kind of clamps right. into it. And I thought, ooh, that won't be good. That'll pinch him. Yeah. And so we grabbed another one of the frame bars and attached it and made, you know, it comes down to a 90, then it 45s down. Mm-hmm. And I bolted it in because mm-hmm. it was just a pin in there that it could move. So I bolted them and uh, doubled up the sling, which we carry 160 pound bear hides on that stuff. You yeah. know, we knew it, but I definitely don't want it to break out there. Right. So we just bulked it up a little bit mm-hmm. and it actually rode very well. Um, uh, and so, um, but yeah, it's just kind of one step at a time. Um, and, uh, you know, John just encourages me not to be a pansy, you know, keep <laughs> going. And so that always uh, helps me. Well, How far do you have to go? Uh, goat hunt, we went up about 2000, a little over 2000 feet when I mean, mm. it was about a five mile round trip. in, so we didn't have to go super far in, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to lie. I was glad it wasn't any further. <laughs> That's a long way. Um, that much weight. Yeah. And, um, and then on the sheep hunt, I mean, <sighs> Glenda, the outfitter really took good care of us and, and put us in a spot that it was a little more like rolly, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I would say plateaus that went up into some of the steeper shale mountains. And in that place, you know, the sheep were just on the cusp of the steep okay. uh, shale. And, we, you know, we were we had to go a few miles mm-hmm. to them, but it was fairly easier going on. terrain. And uh, but, you know, we killed the ram right at dark, a few miles from camp. And then um, uh, just stayed out or we left the kill site at like one thirty in the morning. And, you know, we look up, it was so magical. We had Northern lights just banging up in the sky. So awesome. Wow. And I mean, it was probably the best display I have personally ever seen Really, just because I haven't seen a ton of them actually. Cause in Kodiak, we don't get yeah. the Northern lights as much. Mm-hmm. And so that was really special for us to, you know, I would take like oh, a 20 man. minute break, sit down and just, <laughs> just watch. Like, and, and John was blown away by it. John oh. was so stoked. What a special experience. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we almost ran our 
cameras out of uh, just space just because of we're like, oh, man, I got to try to. Of course, you can never get it <laughs> yeah. as good on your cell phone. As right? you can see. Yeah. But luckily, we had some photographers there that was able to grab some pretty cool stuff. But, you know, I told the guys, I'm like, hey, there's no reason to hike back to camp. And I don't want to, you know, fall and hurt myself or John. So let's just camp out here. We just stayed in a little creek bottom. And it was really lovely evening. And we woke up and uh cooked up some uh tenderloins back strap for breakfast over like the little slate rock and made a fire it was it was Dude, great that's once in a lifetime experience you got to do that kind of stuff out yeah. there yeah you know it's uh, it's very special and you know i was really uh felt very blessed to be able to oh, um you know have that experience with those guys and and like i say you know you 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 asked, well, did you, about what I did. That's literally all I did was carry him. And I, I wasn't stressed <laughs> at all about my, my stress is to just not drop John. Yeah. You know, uh, don't fall. And um, because I knew our guide, Cash, was like a legit, very mm. good sheep guide, very yeah. good guide all around. So it was, I literally had zero stress about that. I oh, knew good. he would do anything and everything possible yeah. to get it done. And, yeah. and he's a beast as well. So. It was a lot of fun. We had a, a wonderful time up there. So it was really yeah. cool to see because, you know, I, uh, watching those old Gordon Eastman videos up there. Yeah. Right. I know. So cool. Yeah. So cool. Um, those are, you know, like I've told the Eastman boys, it's like, man, one of the tax members I've worked with in Kodiak forever, he, he, I would go over in the mornings to go flesh or in the evenings. And he'd be like, hey, I'm inside having coffee, watching the video. Okay, <laughs> so I'd go in there and have coffee, and we'd be watching, we'd watch the same video over and over. <laughs> and it was up there, you know, Gordon hunting sheep up there, yeah. same camp. Oh, man. Same camp. That's How awesome. special is that to that be able to awesome. go up in the mountains right where, you, you know, it's just one of those iconic yeah. films, and in the, in the, in the music is like therapeutic. <laughs> classic it's almost like, music. Yeah, it's just classic, therapeutic uh, stuff, and the narrating, it's pretty neat. You know, yeah. that's why I was telling John, I'm like, man, we're blessed to be here. And he thought oh. that was very cool, you know, so. That's a, what, what a, I mean, those are, it is a once in a lifetime experience to have all those things come together on a hunt and have it all work out like that with the big caribou, mm. a ram, you being there with the Northern Lights, just the whole staying out. It's just like, it was scripted. It couldn't have went any better. And yeah. you're out of there in three days. That's unbelievable. I think we were home. We were out of there, or we were at least back in camp before the other hunters even were home. <laughs> oh, God. I, and I honestly think we had so many prayers going up that it was it like must've. God was like, all right, all right, we got to get these guys done. This yeah. is this is a little bit much. I mean, a pastor of our church there in Kodiak was like, I was traveling. I told my dad, and my dad had his church praying for you, and then all these other people I knew of. And I was like, I wow, you yeah. know, like I find this out afterwards. I'm like, it's no wonder we got this done. Yeah, a lot of power. It's yeah. Power of prayer is very, very... Uh, it's very impressive, I will say that. Man, well, that sounds like a, a great trip. Good job on being part of that. Well, I was just, like I say, fortunate to be able to be a part of those things. And, uh, you know, the big thing is is getting guys like John out into the field, um, you know, because, like I say, otherwise they don't get to do it. And the thing is, those kind of guys are extreme people. Mm -hmm. They did an extreme job, and they loved that extreme job. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, being hurt or wounded or what, whatever you want to call it, I mean, a lot of people that want to take people hunting in those situations want to throw them in a buggy, mm -hmm. drive them out somewhere. Not so extreme. And be like, okay, man, shoot from the truck, shoot from, and, and, yeah. and, and, and thank you to those people yeah, who, because yeah. that's what they can do. Right. And, the, and some that's guys, they know, probably. that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But the things I like to do for these guys, especially the guys that I've been able to do it with, um, I want to make them feel like, because I tell them these are the exact same hunts that I take my other guys on. Yeah. I'm not doing anything different for you right. on this. Mm -hmm. I just want you to know. Like, we're going to help you as much as we can. Yeah, I maybe hired a couple more guys to be in here to help. Um, but this is the exact same float hunt. This is the exact same mm. goat hunt. Um, it was pretty cool with John. We were sitting there at the Wild Sheep Show and and uh, in my booth, and this guy came in, outfitter buddy of mine from Colorado, and he, uh, he um, said, hey, nice to meet you, John, and he goes, oh, you got a goat, I see. Yeah, there's a picture on there. Cool. He goes, yeah, I hunted it. I said, yeah, um, 
Russ hunted goats meat last year too. Oh, really? Russ said, man, I wouldn't do a really crappy spot. God, it was it was trash. God, <laughs> I hated it. I was stuck in there, man, and blah, blah, blah. It hurt, you know, I was hurting my ankles, hurting my feet, all this stuff. It was it was horrendous. And I showed him, I said, yeah, this is where John shot his goat. And he goes, you took him the same spot I did? <laughs> it, and, you know, it was good for John to see too because yeah. he was like, oh, wow, you did take me to yeah. like a legit yeah. spot because <laughs> that guy was like, you're crazy. How did, why did you take him in there? Uh, like, well, we take him where the goats are, man. That's right. We take him where the deer are, take him where the sheep are. Like, yeah. it is what it is. But, the, you know, those guys, especially in the like special operations mm -hmm. community, you know, it's really cool to be able to get them back out there and, and let them – make what they want of it. Mm -hmm. If they need a little extra help, we will do that. Yeah. But some of those guys want a little bit of, you know, struggle, a little bit of, to show them, you know, uh, they can still do this, you know. Um, we took a, some guys out Audad hunting in Texas at my buddy's place, and we took a guy, Clint Trial, amazing individual. Yeah, I know him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love that dude. Yeah. And it was great. like his first, like, legit hunt after... Um, his injuries and, and to watch him, you know, double amputee, you know, he's got prosthetics, but it's, it's very painful to watch yeah. him on uneven rocks and stuff. But, you know, we, Hey, what do you need? Can we? And he's like, mm -hmm. Nope, let me do this. Mm -hmm. And to watch him, you know, move over these rocks and to get into position to shoot for odd ads down in these canyons and whatnot. I mean, it was it was painful, but also very powerful to watch. Yeah. And that was really, really cool. But, uh, and I, th I thank Evan for, from Blackheart for, you know, hooking us up to, to take him. Cause yeah. those are, I love taking those kind of guys that they don't want it easy. They want mm -hmm. to be able to, cause after that, okay, all right, I can do this. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't, but I can still yeah. do this. That, that's the cool thing to watch those guys. Where the, do. where the interest of, trying to help guys like that come from, from you just like an evolution to, to there? Or have you always had this allegiance to military? You know, um, so I never served. Uh, you know, it was kind of weird. My grand, my grandfathers, both of them, World War II. Well, one was World War II, one was uh, Korean War, but it wasn't really talked about or anything. Mm -hmm. My interests were always going to Alaska, but once, it, you know, then uncles in the Coast Guard, okay. But once I got up there, I got to know... Um, we have a Navy SEAL training base up there. Mm -hmm. Got to know several of the instructors over the years. Um, you know, John Barklow, you know John. Right. Met John in 2003, mm -hmm. and he came, and I was on a uh, volunteer search and mountain search and rescue deal there, and uh, he came in to give us a talk about how to wear uh, clothing, mm -hmm. you know, just strictly on how to layer, how to use your, your clothing. Mm -hmm. And that really opened my eyes for how to, you know, just appropriately dress in the mountains, right? right? So, but like through John and, and other, just getting to meet instructors over the years mm -hmm. and getting to know those types of individuals and hanging out with them and seeing their brotherhood and, you know, going to barbecues with them and them like welcoming me into their groups and just, you know, that was like really cool. And it was kind of also for me like, man, I wish I wish we had more time in life because that seems like such a I'm like I'm just going out hiking around mm -hmm. in the woods, you know, shooting animals. Like yeah. I feel like there's other parts like man I, I kind of wish I was able to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish there was more time that I I could, you know, go do that. But I have to, you know, we all know we can't can't go back and change anything and I wouldn't right. now. Mm -hmm. But it's like now I like to, after seeing some of those guys be affected by war or just, uh, and especially like meeting Evan and those guys from Black Rifle and him, because uh, like the other big part was uh, going and helping out at one of the the first uh, Black Rifle adaptive athlete shoot for archery, mm -hmm. went to help those guys uh, just learn how to shoot bows. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and a lot of these guys were all uh, either amputee, you know, arms, hands, uh, legs, whatever. And a lot of them were first time bow shooters. Mm. And so that was really cool. Went to the Easton, um, uh, center there to help them. Salt Lake. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So Evan had bought them all kit, new kits, of bows mm. and everything and uh, full kits of stuff. And so they just showed up, they had a case with their name on it. And so we were just teaching guys and a lot of stuff, like some of these guys, okay, they're missing a leg, 
and you're thinking, okay, they got hands, they should be able to do this. Well, IED would blow up in lots of fragments in their hands, so they can't feel their hands. So right. some of the guys couldn't really feel their trigger fingers. Mm. We had one gal that had a pretty messed up hand, and the whole goal was just for guys to shoot the bow. Yeah, yeah. Not like, mm. wow, amazing technique. Right. It was, I remember one of the gals, we got it strapped. Uh, she couldn't hold it in her hand. She was really strong. She worked out all the time, but she couldn't really hold it in her hand. So we got it strapped in between her fingers. Wow. And we strapped it on there. Mm -hmm. And she finally was able to pull back. And when she shot that arrow, Evan and I looked at each yeah. other and like literally we were trying to hold back our tears because she was crying. And it was just like just releasing the wow. arrow. Yeah. Releasing the arrow mm -hmm. was magic. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what was really cool. Right. To see all those guys, there's a handful that could shoot their bows pretty good already. But, mm -hmm. you know, you got another guy sitting with the mouth tab, you know, yeah. shooting and all this stuff. And it's like that to me, being around that, that community of people was like, yeah. okay, this is what I, I want to do. I need to be able to do this each year, you know. Yeah, and um, that's important. Yeah, it's just but like getting to know a bunch of those guys over the years um, has been been a really neat experience for me. And I've and uh so, and, and, you know, my other like passion is for like kids, you know, that's the next big thing is I would love, I know it's harder because it's Alaska, mm -hmm. right? And you can't just send a bunch of kids up on a jet to Alaska. Yeah. But if there was something, you know, where, uh, had a chaperone come up with mm -hmm. some, you know, teenage kids or something that don't have as much, uh, hunting mentors, right. right. And to get them out there, because that was me, my parents didn't hunt. No mm -hmm. one of my family hunted. And so, I mean, if they did, it was very light. My dad, my first memories was my dad walking across the yard with some pheasants while I was playing in the backyard. It was mm -hmm. some guys from church. They went out Sunday afternoon, shot some pheasants, I think. And they're walking across the yard. And I just remember thinking, I want to do that. And I was four. My mom yeah. would tell, you were four when that happened. <laughs> and that was my earliest memory. It imprinted yeah. upon me. And so it's kind of one of those, one of those things that, but what I, what I was going to say is that those, my dad stopped hunting immediately after that mm. because uh there and i blame my sister because my my mom got pregnant mm. and uh my dad sold his guns the bass boat all that stuff and because they're doing an addition on the house and my wow. dad i think just socially hunted with friends yeah. you know bird hunted in kansas right. you know so it wasn't like his passion mm -hmm. you know but i wanted to do it yeah because I, cause I cause number one, you want to do things your dad does, you know, and I thought, wow, that's cool. That's what adults do. Yeah. But then it all went away. Why I wanted to continue to do it, I don't know. But mm -hmm. thank God uh, when my parents did, uh, after they split up, we moved up to Kansas City, at least in Missouri, actually. And one, some folks through our church introduced me to an old timer that uh, kind of led me along and got me into hunting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's like, yeah, if you go get your... Um, hunter safety course, then, uh, you know, we'll take you out deer hunting. And so, yep, done. Went out and got the hunter safety course. Kill a buck. And, uh, yep. First, uh, first season, uh, you know, it's kind of one of those divine things. It was kind of, <laughs> I say divine thing. I was a little impatient sitting at my tree. You're just sitting at a tree and it's at a tree in the Ozarks of Missouri. It's World War II out there. Pow, pow, yeah, pow, pow, pow. You're hearing all these gunshots going off. And I got a little bit antsy, got up towards the end of the evening, walked over towards uh, Glenn's tree because I thought maybe I'll push deer towards him along yeah. the creek bottom. And I got over there. Well, he was gone. Uh. And all of a sudden, pow, right over next to my tree. And I was like, well, that's weird. <laughs> so several hundred yards back, I go walking over there, and there's Glenn at my tree. And there was a dead doe on the ground. And he just looked at me, and he goes, you got to be patient, boy. Yeah. And I was like, dang it. I totally messed this up. Yeah. You know, dang it. If I only had patience, I would have shot it. Because it is brown, it's down. Yeah. We do not care about horns, nothing. Right. It is deer tag. Can't eat the horns, I heard. Can't eat the horns. <laughs> So the next morning, all right, we'll go sit over here at this other tree. Well, first light, heard some limbs breaking and and uh, out pops this deer. And I was like, okay, wow, I think it's a buck. And open sight, 30-30, pow, shoot him at 60 yards. And, uh, you know, got over there, pulled him next to my tree, waited for a while, waited for old man Glenn to get over there. Nothing. I run over to his tree. He's gone. I go up there, and he's just sitting up there we passed each other somewhere in the brush and, <laughs> and he's up there gutting my deer oh. and he wouldn't even talk to me. And I was like, Oh man, did I mess up? Did I mess up? And he just looked up. He goes, 
no, you did real good. You did real good. And I was like, okay. I just didn't know, how, you know, <laughs> what, how reactions should yeah, be, right. you know? And, uh, we go to, tr we end up putting the back of the truck, go to church, show his people. Everyone's like, wow, wow. Oh man, that's a big deer. End up being a 151 inch buck Whoa. by far the largest deer that's a down in deer. that country. <laughs> it was like, you know, six year old buck yeah. in the Ozarks Wow. of which who, how it got through that minefield yeah. of, of, uh, you know, hunters right. for and that many years. That many bullets? <laughs> no clue. But yeah. I, yeah, so, uh, you know, and they told me, several people like, hey, you should probably mount this thing. And so I called my mom. I was like, hey, mom, uh, they say I should mount this deer. And she's like, well, son, we, we can't afford that. Mm. And I thought, okay. And I didn't argue. I just said, uh, sorry, guys, we can't mount it. And they were just like, are you sure? Because, right. you know, otherwise we got to take the cape or not, yeah. you know, and. And so I said, sorry, I can't. So my dad for Christmas helped make me uh, a plaque to put the horns on yeah. and stuff like that. It was really nice. Still got it. It was really cool, a little wood plaque. And, and uh, but uh, yeah, that, that was my first buck, 150 inch white tail. Still have not killed one bigger. <laughs> really? So yeah. Yep. So <laughs> even down there at the Yeti Ranch in, in Texas? I didn't uh, actually, I never. Uh, I went down there, but we weren't deer hunting. Oh. We were just uh, shooting pigs and stuff oh, okay. like that. Yeah. Is that down? Um, what, what is that? Because I think it's right by where I hunt. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I was hunting. Uh, what is there? Is the Paloma Ranch or yeah, something like that? GK Paloma. But yeah. I think Yeti, from what I heard, they might be buying it. Oh, your place? Yeah. Well, yeah, so, they got to let you so, go, so right? I'm the done. hunter. <laughs> I'm done. But I killed that Dang. that big white tail back there. That chicken is what it's called. But uh, he had the white on him. Oh, wow. And that, that was on uh, G GK. But then this year I was down there and there was this big buck that were calling Prince. Mm. Supposedly he's only five or whatever. But yeah. he's like... Yeah, he's off limits because they had this agreement with Yeti and GK. <laughs> and of course, this buck, you know, I killed, I killed, I don't know what I killed. I think I killed a buck finally. And then I sat this blind because it was where Prince was coming in. I just wanted to see him. Of course, he comes in like, 10 yards away, giant, like a 190 inch white tail, but <sighs> off limits. That's the way it goes. <laughs> it just sits there looking at you, I hanging know. out. That's just, uh, yeah, it's kind of the way that uh, that happens. So but. you've never been able to hunt down there? Not, not for deer. Not for deer. I've hunted at a, a friend's place in um, uh, down there uh, by Creso Springs and whatnot uh, a couple of times, like for cold deer. Yeah. Um, but it, I mainly just, it's like, I'm, we're mainly bow hunting and it just doesn't quite work out yeah. or we're looking for this certain eight point or right. nine point or yeah. something of that nature. And, um, I, I maybe shot one in the high fence one time that their ranch manager was like, Hey, we need this one out of there. But I didn't, I mean, no offense. I didn't count that one. So, <laughs> but I mean, that one was probably a little bit bigger than yeah. that 150. But like I say, it's not, I'm not going to be yeah. personally going to. Well, 150 is a big white tail. I yeah, mean, especially for your especially open sight thirty thirty. Open sight thirty thirty, man. It's I, a hell of a shot. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that, but that's what we always shot with. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I bought, uh, uh, I thought, okay, I saved my money and I bought a Bushnell scope and put it on there. Four and, power. Yeah, or maybe a three Bushnell to nine banner. or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, I was like sniper. I know. I'm a sniper. <laughs> oh, I know. I am a sniper. So now. sick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So when you're, well, because you, I mean, you hunting up here in Oregon for blacktails yeah. is super thick, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we hunt the logging unit so you can have longer shots, but my first, my first deer or um, first rifle was a model 99, 300 Savage. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. So it was a lever action, Yep. Um, but had a Bushnell banner on it. Yep. And, you know, Old hey, Bushnell banner. I know those worked. Yeah, man, I took, and I think I put that on my, my first long range rifle I bought still in high school, bought a seven mag and uh i put that on there and man when i moved up to alaska i put a, a nicer scope on and it never shot the same really never shot the same as with uh, that bush what was the scope you got <laughs> oh i mean it was a good it i think i bought a used loophole or something oh. which i have tons of loophole i love loophole scopes it's all i shoot and but uh it was like one i bought at a pawn shop probably dropped probably <laughs> My, yeah i need to send it back they'd probably redo it or give me a new one but i thought no this is this is like the history you know the gold ring dude yeah 
I mean, it's it's one of those things where when I say like the banner, I was able to hit pennies yeah. like within a penny at a hundred yards, and then it went to like an inch and a half group or something. That's probably my rifle. It's probably not really the scope, but <laughs> it's anyways. But no, it was uh, it was good. Those are good times, and I think uh, you know one of the things. Um, a while back, I was talking with Bert Soren, which I know Bert was on here, right? Yeah. No, he hasn't been on here. Oh, Bert right. wasn't? No, no. He hasn't oh, been here yet. Okay. Um, so, but uh, Bert, good buddy of mine, and, but we talked about like um, having mentors. Yeah. And, and those mentors helping, you know, young people get into hunting and, and having someone you can talk. And it's not necessarily about young people. It's about a person getting into hunting. Yeah. Right. I mean, Roy was there with you. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And I know you looked up to him, but having those people to look up to and bounce stuff off of yeah. is, is like really important. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, that's what I try to tell guys now. Cause I'm, I know you get reached out all the time, mm -hmm. right. About, Hey, I'm thinking about bow hunting. Hey, I'm thinking about elk hunting. What should I do? You know, and all this stuff. And, you know, my thing is, is talking to guys about, man, going to, your archery shop mm -hmm. and hanging out, yeah, being there, you know, uh, being around it. Yeah, go volunteer there. Go, go, just hang out there. Go yeah. be around people. Mm -hmm. You know, don't be annoying and asking where do you go hunting. Yeah. Give me your spot. Yeah. Just be there, yeah. and maybe if maybe someone will invite you to come along. Yeah, and you can learn. Don't and and or just go and help someone pack yeah. out a bowl. Right. You know. Um, and, and, and just go help them on their hunt. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone just wants to jump into it, go kill their animal and go post it. Yeah. You know, and that's put in the time. Yeah. And it's the efforts. It's the journey. It's as, the journey. Like to say. The journey. It's a lifelong journey. Yeah. And I've been shooting a bow since probably, I would say first one was probably five, six years old. Then I bought a bear recurve at a garage sale at like um seven and i shot that for a long time mm -hmm. and uh i meant no maybe it was eight eight but uh regardless bought like for 12 bucks and it had like 20 random arrows yeah and but just like i didn't start bow hunting though until i was 15 yeah 14 50 actual so bow hunting years of shoot yeah shooting but even shooting an arrow as you said you know with that adaptive shoot just just releasing an arrow is oh yeah so empowering to yeah. people just watching that arrow arc towards the target mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. yeah and, and you don't even yeah just shooting shooting a bow is so therapeutic mm -hmm. you know it really is because it's like uh i'm not a huge fly fisherman but like if i'm fly fishing I focus. I'm focusing on my technique, mm -hmm. and if I'm shooting my bow, I have to focus. Yeah, you're gonna miss. And you know. uh, and just the practice, of getting out there is is very therapeutic for people. And even if you're not a bow hunter, but you go because it, it was interesting, which I always thought, well, everyone who shoots a bow is a bow hunter. <laughs> but come to find out, there's a lot of people who just like to target shoot. Yeah, right. And just and just because you're like, I don't know if I'm ever not gonna shoot a deer. Well. You can still go shoot a bow. Yeah. It's still yeah. a lot of fun. Oh, and you never great. know. You never know when that day may come that someone invites you yeah. to go to the ranch or to, you know, out hiking, you know, here in Oregon or wherever, Colorado, wherever, Alaska. And you're like, you know what? Maybe I can do this. Yeah. I have been shooting my bow. Same thing with guns, right? It's like I do it's like learn the safety, learn the techniques. Yeah, the basics. The basics yeah. first. That's what I've tried to do with this lift run shoot is, you know, a lot of these people haven't been around archery before. So it's yeah. just like they, they probably they get a bow, they take it home. They probably won't ever hunt some of them. That's all right. Oh, but yeah. some of them might. And like there's been people who uh, have left here. It's like they've been shooting their bow every day, you yeah. know, and some people will probably never pick it up again. But whatever. It's OK. It's, you never know. No, it's it's all good. But that's the. That's the greatest. I mean, I think that's our job as kind of old in the tooth hunters now is like, hey, we need to protect this tradition. And part of that is mentoring people who want to be involved and and spreading the love we have for the pursuit and doing it the right way. And uh, that's how we, you, you leave a legacy, basically. And <clears throat> that's what Roy did with me. And um, you've done with countless of others. And it's uh, I don't know. It's kind of our obligation, I think. Yeah, I 100% agree, and and uh, you know, 
there's there's like just different um, milestones, I guess, as you get as you get older and moving along um, in life. And you know, and I still love getting out there. But man, there's nothing nothing like uh, watching someone take their first animal or or uh, or getting in close and you know shooting a bear or elk or you know it's it's very very uh, very empowering for them. Yeah. And, and showing them that they can do this, yeah. you know, and to watch them be able to take their meat home, cook it. You know, it's not rocket science. No, no it's not rocket science. We've been doing this for a long time, but yep. we're just so detached from it nowadays. Or some some people are, some societies are. But, um, yeah, not, not much has changed. No. <laughs> been doing the same stuff for a long time, as long as man's been alive. Do you, yeah. remember, do you remember the first time that we met? You and I... Well, I met, yeah, in Kodiak, right? Yeah. Yep. I remember, yeah, we were uh, at the Shelikoff Lodge, I think. <laughs> I think you I, were coming in and we were dropping some guys off. And I remember like, I think that's Cam Haynes. Yeah, that's and right. And then some guys in our group, new, new guys in your group, and they got to talking. And then I think uh, we saw you guys at the sushi joint and we went yeah. over to, we invite you to come over to... Uh, Watch some videos that we did. Whose house was that again? That was Jack King's house, yes, I think. That's we right. Do. Old Jack King. Yeah, watch, yeah. We watched some hunting videos. Yeah, God, that, that, that was, was cool. Fun. Yeah, and the, it was fun. Um, yeah, old Tom Hoffman was there. That's I mean, right. Legendary bow hunter, of which you know a lot of people don't know who Tom Hoffman oh, is, right? He's he not a social a media guy, but no, he's done so much and super slam with the bow. Yeah, all Pope and young animals, I believe. Yeah, and you know the thing is also. Uh, Tom was a huge influence in my life um, for like international hunting. Mm. And a lot of people were like, oh, international, you know, it's expensive, all this stuff. Well, the stuff that I was more influenced by what he was doing was not that expensive. It, and I would just get to know these people at mm -hmm. shows and these opportunities would come, up, come about. But the point was he showed me these videos of like Azerbaijan, yeah. Nepal, like yeah. all. And I was like, Wow. Wow, look at that and the cultural experiences. And because a kid from Kansas, you know, my travel was to go to Alaska. Yeah. I had never traveled outside the country. Yeah, and so most people haven't. No. And so it was when I first, I think I went on an African trip, um, 2007 or something. And that was, it was really cool. I bought it at an auction for like 2,500 bucks. Mm -hmm. You know, I was a guy that was like my tip money. It was a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, but I was watching these films from Tom Hoffman and Azerbaijan and like he's sh showing these mules going up the mountains. There's live chickens on the back and they, you'd take them up there. You'd, you'd eat the chickens <laughs> to, to, and yeah. and uh, and all these really cool things. And so he inspired me to start traveling abroad because the mm -hmm. other thing was as a guide, I'm busy throughout most all the U.S. seasons. Right. I have no time to go hunt deer, elk you know, moose, bears for myself. Mm -hmm. It's always closed. And so there were these hunts that I was seeing elsewhere that were in March or June, July, yeah. uh, you know, January, February, early December. And uh, some of my most memorable hunts were was because of being inspired by Mr. Hoffman. Really? Uh, watching, because he always carried little DVDs with him and he'd hand oh, them I out know. to you. I got them. Yeah. <laughs> I got one for and sure. I was like, wow, that's so <laughs> cool. And so you never know how many people like that kind of guy has inspired oh. to go do stuff. I uh, Yeah, I remember at the time, I think I got a DVD from him. I think there was five people who, five bow hunters who had done the Super Slam and they were all at the ATA show at that mm -hmm. time. Wow. They took a picture of him and him and Chuck Adams and probably Bob Fromm and uh, man, I can't remember who else. But anyway, I, that's when I got the DVD from him. And he's seemed like just a great guy. I just loved to talk bow hunting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, man. That, and he's so much fun. Um, he actually he actually was in, he came into sheep camp right after us in Northwest Territories this, this year. year. Yep. He brought his wife up there. How old is he now? He's got to be pushing 80. Yeah. And... Um, he actually ended up going, he was just hiking along and I, we were told he was just going to hang in camp yeah. and let his wife go out hunting and mm -hmm. he would just chill behind because he wasn't sure if he was up to it. Well, he changed his mind mm. once he got into camp yeah, and uh, decided, nope, I'm going. But I thought, 
well, he'll be back in a few days probably. He'll burn out and be back. Yeah. He stayed out there the whole time <laughs> hiking around, and really? his wife shot a ram and I think a caribou. And uh, But, I mean, he's, I mean, it's amazing. I only can hope Yeah. At 80. I mean, he, I he has to be at 80 because when he hunted with me, I think he came and he was 70 on, I think he's hunted with us once or twice. He was past 70 when mm -hmm. he hunted with us and hiked in 11 miles to really? a camp. Yes. For sheep? Brown bear. Brown bear. Yeah. Wow. Yep. So he's, he's uh, you know, just, yeah, it's, I can only hope that I can take care of myself to, uh, to do that. But he is a prime example of, of just being in a really good attitude, um, and inspiring people to, to get out there, especially bow hunting. Yeah. You know, but, I think uh, is Jack Frost still bow hunting up there? Yeah. 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 He's still getting out. I saw him at the Alaska bow hunters banquet, uh, I think this spring. Mm. So he once again another just legend. Yeah, a lot of fun to talk to. Oh yeah, um, just a wonderful guy, you know, and very experienced. And um, those kind of I I've always growing up. I always enjoyed being around. Uh, of course, they don't want to hear this, but like I always enjoyed being around older guys. Yeah, like listening to stories. Me too. I I was pretty ADD, but <laughs> all over the place. But if someone was telling a hunting story, mm -hmm. I was stone cold locked in, just sitting there fly on the wall and yeah. and uh, just wanted to listen to the story. Mm -hmm. And being, you know, as I got older, going to these outdoor shows, meeting these guys and just sitting there at dinner with them or around them, you just just yeah. sit there and listen. Yeah. That's all you need to do. You know? Have you been to Jack's house? I have. Yeah. 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 Went to Jack's once or twice uh, with Hoffman. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember and Roy and I stayed there. Did you really? Yeah, because uh, the first time I spoke up there at the Alaska Bow Hunters thing, me and Roy went to his. I think we stayed the night there, or I know we went there, and mm -hmm. we, you know, he's got that huge brown bear. I think it was number two at one time. Yeah, he's got just tons of stuff, incredible trophy room. Mm -hmm. But we were just like, just like you, kids in a candy store. Yeah, I mean, just being around a legendary bow hunter is. As as young bow hunters that we were younger at that time, obviously now now I'm old and but whatever. <laughs> but uh, it it was I don't know. I mean, I one of the, the biggest influence I had in this area was we had this uh, bow hunter come in. Jim Hodson was his name, mm -hmm. and he had hunted Kodiak a lot, and he had this this photo album of big eight by ten pictures from Kodiak and big bucks, and and it's just that type of that legacy or that the history of it or sharing the storytelling it's like that's like so important to hunting mm -hmm. and so as as you said when you said you're you know normally you're ADD but unless it's talking about hunting and that's the exact same way we were it's like this is all we wanted to do yeah and here we wanted to not only listen to stories of big adventure from these legends but we wanted to have big adventures. Yep. What's our story going to be? Yep. And that's what it's always been about chasing the biggest adventure. Yeah. And being around those guys, you know, you you pick up these little nuggets, mm -hmm. right. That are important because it's like, Ooh, they're not like telling you, this is where you go all the time. You know, sure. They may help you on some stuff for sure, but just little nuggets that you're picking up about being out there or being a camp or hiking or, or shooting or when it comes time for, you know, calling an elk or yeah. whatever, you just learn all these things because, I mean, I, I feel like I haven't been doing this that long, but realistically, I've been guiding for 21 years, mm -hmm. and it's it's one of those things where I still have a lot to learn, and it's very important that, for me at least, to keep that attitude that I, I have a lot to learn yet, and if you have that humble attitude of, of trying to pick up things from people, because I learn stuff from my hunters all the time that are just like, I look over and see what they're doing. I never thought of that before. <laughs> Little nuggets on gear, yeah. on whatever, you know, and, uh, or they, we're talking about a stock and they mention something and I'll be like, no, we're not going to wait. Yeah, that could work actually, you know, but just, so it's, it's good to keep an open mind and, you know, and to pick up things. You know, I think that's, I do think that that's not, I think that's rare for somebody in your position. I think that a lot of guides I don't know. I don't know. I think they think, I don't know. I know they have a lot of experience or whatever, but I don't think a lot of them have that open mind like you did. And I think it's like, or like you do, I think that's how you keep evolving mm -hmm. is like not thinking you have all the answers. Cause as you said, it's like 
somebody could say something in your initial reaction because you've been doing this your whole life is like no we're not then you're like yeah. wait a second i think yep. a lot of guys miss the wait a second maybe that would work and i, I think that that's that's how you're going to continue to just get better and mm -hmm. evolve and 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 just having that open mind i think as men it's just not natural for us well you have to stop yourself because it's i i do this trust me i still don't do the old nope and then all of a you know but but I have to, because we're just, uh, our ego gets in the way. Yeah. And especially with guides, mm -hmm. it's very common, especially a young guide. You're in charge. Because think about this, and I've seen this all over the world mm -hmm. with guides. This is their only power, potentially, that right. they have. Okay. Uh, I am in control of this person that's coming hunting with me. And they're an employee guide, and this is their control. You're one-on-one, mm -hmm. -on -one, and they have to do what I say. And... Uh, and sometimes you just got to let them, you know, you let, I've been with guides. I'm like, well, okay, if you want to do this, this isn't going to work out, but whatever. <laughs> and I've watched, I, I, and I, and I distinctly remember times uh, where old guys would be watching me getting ready to freaking do this train crash. Yeah. And they're like, okay, young man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but you have to, there's still to this day when I get in kill mode, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is that mode where I'm like, I'll just tell guys just, don't be offended when I, yeah. I don't mean to bark orders at you, right. but when I tell you don't something, take it do personal. it, just please do it. And as we're going along, cause if you hesitate, uh, uh it could cost us yeah. this animal. So please just listen yeah. and don't ask questions unless it's like very, you know, like if I'm totally missing something, right. Cause guys will screw with you. Yeah. Well, don't you think? And, and you start like, eh, well, like and yeah. all of a sudden you're like, dang it, I should have done that. Yeah. Uh, so they can go both ways, right. but you have to, you got to let it in a little bit to make sure you're not overlooking something, that's, especially like with safety and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. That's one thing that's always, you know, we have a hundred together, but one thing I've always admired about you is your, it's like, I, I'm not, everybody has an ego, but you, I don't notice an ego. You know what I mean? You seem like such a, it's an open minded, personable, um, easygoing, uh, confident, but not not like not like overly egotistic. I mm -hmm. mean, and that's one thing that's all, I've always like and we've been out to dinners together and I've seen you interact with people and it's just like it is rare. It's rare to be such a successful guide and outfitter like you are in such a high stakes business and not have the a noticeable ego because those things you know normally if you're this badass you're killing big brown bear you're the man you're the man you, you need to make sure people know you're the man you know what i mean <laughs> and, and you don't well i mean i first thank you i appreciate that but uh it like say it's one thing when you when you've done something for so long i mean you should have a little bit of confidence mm -hmm. in yourself and that's the big thing is is your confidence helps tremendously with doing things, especially like uh, doing hard things, you know, and struggles and whatnot. We will get through this, mm -hmm. you know. And as a guide, you watch guys start crumbling out there and you have to be able to pick them up and to express, don't worry, man, this is going to work out. Yeah. You know, you're, you're a cheerleader and you're helping them through situations and some of them have a lot going on at home or whatever. And uh, you've got to be able to to do it but it's like for me it's when you when you're out there and you're worried about your tent blowing away bears coming in shooting stuff up close and finding wounding bear wounded bears in the brush and making split second decisions and then you know you come out and hang out at shows and talk to people like that's easy yeah you yeah. know whatever and but it's like also i know that uh you know i've been blessed and it doesn't, it won't do me any good to be sitting there bragging about what I do. And I don't think that's, that's not the way I was brought up and, and whatnot. Um, and I still, you know, I feel so blessed to do what I do, but there's still like parts of me, like with social media and stuff that it's like, I like helping people, but I'm also a little bit like, oh, man, I feel like I'm bragging if I'm, <laughs> if I post this about, oh, we did this. Or, oh, look at me with my, I, I, I still like really struggle with that yeah. about worrying that I'm yeah. being braggadocious or, right. or, or whatnot. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but at the end of the day, 
you know, people enjoy learning things and seeing things, you yeah. know, and, and it's, it gives you more confidence when, you know, you post something and people are like, oh man, thanks. That really helped me out or whatever, whatever it may be. And that's just what I try to be is a little bit helpful with people. And yeah. I also know that we both know there are people out there that are at that desk, right? That only get to get out hunting once, twice a year, mm-hmm. right? And they vicariously live through us yeah. and they love it. They right. absolutely love it. And That's a lot of people. You yeah. try to inspire those folks to be out there. And so we forget that at times, mm-hmm. or I do. And so there's a lot of, you know, really good people out there that, you know, reach out to me and or you and to anyone um, in our uh, situations that, you know, that's easy to forget about. Mm-hmm. And um, so they love looking at that. And, you know, when people reach out like, oh, man, that was a really cool podcast or that was a neat, you know, photo. Man, that was cool. I showed my kids, you know, man, they love seeing that. And it's like, oh, man, that, that's pretty cool. You know, yeah. it's neat to that there are people out there that, um, you know, unfortunately, they don't they're not able to get out, you know, like we are. You know, we're very blessed to be able to do this. Yeah, I think it's. But I think it's important, too, because your story shows that you don't have to grow up in Alaska to. Yeah. I mean, because if you would have looked at. So you're in Missouri, right? Yep. Yep. Kansas and Missouri. Both. Right. So and, you know, divorced parents just mm-hmm. just living in a small town and very middle class. Very, Alaska very. is a long way from there. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what's the, what's the chances of you being a guide and outfitter in Alaska hunting the biggest bears in the world mm-hmm. from that? Yeah. But the fact that you did it because your passion, your obsession with it led you there. And here you are. Now you've been doing it for 21 years. Yeah. So to me, that your story gives people hope that, and not even just kids, but like young men, like mm-hmm. thinking, man, Cole did this. Yeah. Cole is like, you know, now everybody in hunting knows your name. Cole Kramer is like synonymous with Big Bear and Kodiak and living an incredible adventurous life. Cole did it. Can I do it? And that's, to me, that's the important part of what you post and how you, how you word it and how you carry yourself is it's like, it's just like, this is possible. Mm -hmm. How bad do you want it? Right. And, and that's the thing is, uh, one of the things I get reached out a lot about, you know, young guys reaching out, whether it be in high school or, or guys looking to change their career. And, um, it's a lot of them are worried about money. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that, of course, when I came in at, you know, 18, 19, I was blessed because I had an aunt and uncle in Kodiak that I Mm -hmm. could stay at their house. But realistically I was gone all the time in the field, just mm-hmm. working for people. But I never asked about money. I just went to go work. Showed up. Just showed up. And, you know, sometimes I get a paycheck, sometimes not. Some people are like, well, we're not going to pay you because we don't really need you out here. But if you want to learn and be an apprentice, you can come out here. Uh, the main guy I've always worked with, he always paid me, but, you know, low amounts of money at first and just all my money went to gear, mm-hmm. you know. And that took years and years for me to get set up with gear you know, for the appropriate gear to not be miserable out there. Right. And, you know, this is, it's, it's very interesting when you think about, you know, when you first started hunting, but then like when I, you know, was moved to Alaska in early two thousands, um, just the gear was so different, you know, we're using Cabela's gear. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I knew that thing, the Cabela's (laughs) Bible front to back, Yeah, you know, I know. but, uh, then, you know, like then switching like mountaineering type of gear and this and that and the other, but just to see the differences and to try, it's very, my point is it's very expensive Mm -hmm. to get set up as a guide. And, um, you know, that can be a deterrent at times, but like I tell guys like, Hey man, you can do this, but it's going to take a little commitment, a little sacrifice. It's going to take some sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for me, sacrificed a lot. <laughs> I'm, you know, 40 years old now, not married, no kids. You know, it's kind of one of those yeah. things where it's like I've, you know, I've kind of slowed down a little bit on like I used to do a lot of international travel and like go all the time. I'm like, man, I got to start like, you know, staying at home a little more, hanging out, trying to have a little bit of a life. I don't know. My buddy said he just went fishing up there in Kodiak and he said that one of the, there's a girl up there. He said, one of the most beautiful girls he's ever seen. And it is on Kodiak and she had lost an arm. Do you know who this is? 
Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah, she lost part of, part of her arm, I think, in a in a like a quad accident. Oh, okay. But she's in Kodiak and she's smoking hot. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> he said she right. was beautiful. So I don't know how many how many uh, candidates there are in Kodiak. Oh, well, there's actually a couple nice gals. You know, I may be talking to one of them there. We'll see. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm just kidding. But, um, no, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's just one of those things that's taken a lot of commitment, yeah. uh, to this. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of hobby guides out there that come to do the 100 year, two mm -hmm. hunts a year, which is fine. We need those. Yeah. We need those guys, but the guys who want to take it full blown, you know, you got to put your time in mm -hmm. and there's not much money in it at the beginning. But where I was going earlier with that is it's, I mean, Doing, you want to do a job that you love to do, and um, it, there's going to be hard times, just like anything. Yeah. But if all you're worried about is money, mm -hmm. you're damn sure not going to be a guide because <laughs> <laughs> that takes a long time yeah. uh, to make any sort of money. Right. You know, I would say it's it's a minimum of three to five years where you're like making you know decent money. You're an outfitter now, right? Yeah, I'm a guide and outfitter, but I still work for two other outfitters and have my own guide service. Mm. So it's a mixture of, of... So you're rich. Oh, man, it's like <laughs> unbelievable the amounts of money I have. It's, uh, <laughs> man, man. Yeah, you're right. You, you know, it's... I, I, I do okay for myself. Yeah. You know? I do okay for myself. But uh, it's just one of those things. It's what I do mm. is, uh, is just like guiding and outfitting. And... It, like you say, it just takes time and everyone, you know, just focus on if you're wanting to become a guide, you just need to put your time in because you can be an amazing hunter. I mean, you know how this goes, Cam. You could say to me, hey, Cole, I think I want to come up and be a guide. We both know just because you're a really good hunter doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a really good guide. Yeah, Probably be a terrible guide. <laughs> I doubt that. I doubt that. But it, the point is, there's we've definitely had some guys come and go that were amazing hunters, but they were really not nice to the, yeah. the clients because they treat it like it was their hunt, right? And they would run after the animal or whatever, yeah. but the guy's back there dying and he can't keep up, and yeah. it's like it doesn't do you any good to run over there if you can't communicate and or help the person along, you know, uh, and and get them there. Yeah. No, I know. What good does it do? Two different and, things. And, and what it, a lot of it is, is the guys find out themselves. They're like, man, this just isn't for me. Right. Because I can't stand it, you yeah. know? And trust me, there's definitely times where I've been pretty frustrated. And we, you know, we definitely try to filter out the people that uh, I don't think are going to be very... Uh, yeah suited for our type of hunting. Not a good match. Not a good match for yeah. us. And yeah. and um, and then we the people that we do take, we still try to match them with the guide we think that's accordingly. Yeah. You know, because, you know, it's like my buddy Shane who passed away with mm -hmm. uh, Jim Tweedo. Yeah. I mean, that Shane was, I mean, one of the best. I mean, he's a killer. Mm -hmm. he, that dude, you put him on that mountain for with that animal or for anything. Anything. Yeah. anything doesn't matter. And that dude hunted nonstop. When I first met him, he just hunted nonstop. Mm. And he was guiding fishermen in the summertime all the way through, then put his sheep boots on and pack and go up in the mountains. As soon as he was done, he was killing the old deer down in Idaho and chasing Jeez. cats and then right back into springs. I mean, it's just never ending. Yeah. And But that dude, you know, because when I was uh, guiding for Lance for a while up there, uh, Shane and I were good buddies, and we never got to actually hunt together for the most part because we were mm. always guiding different guys. We'd get together afterwards, have a beer, hang out. and But, like, you know, there was a if there was a guy mm -hmm. that could go, it yeah. was aggressive. You know, Lance, you're like, all right. Shane was a guy. This is Shane's going, and then he'd give me a guy that was, like, Mission Impossible, as he said. <laughs> you may have to encourage this guy. You may have to be a cheerleader with this one. I'm like, no, oh, thanks. See, that's when am what I going to get a Shane hunter? That's Come what on. you get for being nice. Yeah, that's the problem. It's not, no one likes a nice guy. Come on. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, no, it's just, it's one of those things, like, you know, I mean, the, so you have to know how to match those kind of people. Yeah. You know, but... Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Um, Shane, he got what happened with him and with that bear? 
because he got torn up by a bear two yeah. years before. Yeah, uh, a few, few years before. I think it was 2017, mm. 19 or 17. But it was a wounded bear in the Yeah, hole. wounded bear in yeah. the brush. I think a guy hit it poorly with the rifle and it mm -hmm. went into the brush and Shane went in there and I think the rifle got caught up in the brush or oh. something of that nature when he went to to when the bear rushed him and got mm -hmm. uh, munched on a little bit. But I yeah, I called him while he was in the hospital and mm -hmm. and uh, just chatted with him and he, you know, when I talked to him I was actually in Hawaii at the time hunting axis deer mm. and uh, called him and you know, he was in good spirits. Yeah. yeah got, he always called me his little buddy. He's like, well, he got me little buddy, but you know, that's all right. I, I'm all good. Oh, like, sheesh. Yeah. Very scary. But, you know, talking about a guy who just, you know, got back on his horse and, you know, right went out there. But, uh, yeah, very, very good guide. But, you know, yeah, it's just kind of one of those. tragedy too. I mean, because he had young family, didn't he? Yeah. Also. Young little girl and wife and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah terrible but um but yeah so um yeah it's just one of those deals you never know when when uh things go south as we were saying earlier i think you said like when roy fell didn't you hear on the radio or something or were you i thought you told me maybe it was you but you guys had heard somehow i think i was out in the in the uh mountains when it when i, I mean because yeah I either heard over sat phone call or something that yeah. like oh man just so you know this happened and it was like really yeah. and then i got i saw you up at that 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 was alaska bow hunters banquet i believe because mm -hmm. you came up there to to talk and then you were going to see the family afterwards i believe because yeah. that yeah. was in the springtime though mm -hmm. that was a while after because he passed in october october so, yeah. yeah he was on that pioneer peak hunt yeah yeah. Or they couldn't a lake. Yeah, it was, a, it was the October hunt. But yeah, I went up there and spoke and his every time I talk about him, it's still like I still can't talk normal about it. It's mm -hmm. like every time I think of him, it's like I just get turned into a emotional baby, I guess. But it's like it's you know, I just remember that. I remember, I think you told me you heard about it and couldn't mm -hmm. believe it, something like that. But yeah, I mean. Well, those those people, obviously he made a giant impact and it's just one of those things where, you know, it's a piece of, of your heart and your mind, body and soul that like is, you know, he's there, but it, it's gone, mm -hmm. you know? And that just, it, it's like, do you want that pain to go away? No. No. Yeah. I mean, that's the same. Like, I want to be able to think, you know, no. I still sit here, um, I'll be on a hunt or at home, and I think about my Uncle Robin. Mm -hmm. You know, he passed 2007. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, gosh, I mean, I just wish he was here to see this. I wish he was, you know, I wish that we could, I wish I could show him this. I wish that he could see what his sons are doing. I wish he could meet his grandkids. You know, I just, you think about that, and you're yeah. like, ah, ah, you know, and you got to, you know, you take it in for a bit, but it's just, all right, all right, you know, then move on. But it's like, I I still like having that emotion. You know, it shows that that person was special to yeah. you, you know. And it's, you know, same thing with, with, with Shane. You know, I had a hunt that I was uh, going to be doing that was, you know, deer and fishing and some other stuff. And I was like, oh, yeah, Shane would be perfect for this. And then I just kind of put my head down like, oh, dang. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking like he's gone, you know, and it just, but I like his, his, his name would pop up in my brain like, oh yeah, I should mm -hmm. talk to him about this. And it's like, oh, wait, no, yeah. I can't, I can't talk to him. Yeah. You know, and it's, you know, everyone has their ways of dealing with stuff. And, you know, like this year was a rough year. My, my really good friend, Derek, his, his wife passed away, Ruby Blake, and, and it was very, very, uh, it was rough, mm -hmm. really, really hard on us, and obviously for him and his little baby daughter and everything. But it was just like, uh, I mean, you, you just don't understand it, how it could have happened, you know, and all this stuff. But it's just very, very difficult. But when you sit there and think about, you know, man, this person really was a big impact on my life. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you don't always know it. Obviously, with Roy, you did know it. But some of us that lose someone in our life that was a friend and you, you, you realize how much how important that person was in your life yeah you know it's hard yeah. for hard to explain right everyone's different it, yeah. it's, it is difficult to explain for me at least but 
It is. It's like, for me, it's like it's, these hunts go and they go great and then it works out the way you want, but it's like there's something missing because we'd always, whether he would killed something, I remember he killed a big big bear on Kodiak and he called mm -hmm. me on the sat phone or if I killed, I'd call him afterwards. And so it's like that part's missing, the yeah. sharing the part or even being together on a hunt. And so it's never, it feels like all these great experiences are just a little bit less than they could have been, you know? Yep. And it's like, I'm sure you have things you'd want to share with Shane or hear about his thing. Yep. And without having that, it feels like, I don't know. It feels like it's, it's great. The experiences are great, but it's just not the same. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about it. Yeah. And it's, you know, I've definitely sat on this side of the mountain before and just had a conversation mm -hmm. and just send it up. And I just, uh, you know, I said, I, I've said it out loud and want them to know, you know, Lord, I hope maybe you can pass this on to him. Maybe he's listening. Maybe he can hear it. Maybe he can't. But it, it's therapeutic to kind of send up thoughts, especially when you're on the mountainside. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's almost like, you know, writing is therapeutic, yeah. right? Writing a, a, a letter or note to someone who's maybe gone or just or not, but just writing stuff down is, is pretty therapeutic, I think. And uh, um, it, I, I like being able to sit there on the mountain and think, all right, I, I told him how I feel. You know, I've, I've, I've shared something with him, you know, on the mountainside, you know, or that he's looking down and watching that what's going on, mm -hmm. you know. And because uh, it was like with my Uncle Robin, I was like, man, so many things were lined up so good when he passed. Like he took care of a lot of things right before he passed. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. And it was just like, man, I mean, it just sucks that he's gone, but did the good Lord need him for something? Yeah. It was because he was such a good guy. Everyone mm -hmm. loved him. Mm -hmm. And it seems like that's the way it goes. Yeah. There was a reasoning that they needed him, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it's you can choose to dwell in all the negative things or you can choose to look at it in a, in a, in a positive light. It still hurts, mm -hmm. but, you know, that's the way I have to personally look at it is like apparently, you know, the good Lord needed him and it was his time. Yeah, it's hard to question that. It's hard to question it for me. Yeah. And, you and, know? and it's hard to, to make sense of it sometimes too because it's like you can't, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't understand sure. everything. But, yeah. I think, you know, and in your line of work, it's inherently risky. So, I mean, you are going to lose, you're going to lose men. Mm -hmm. It's just the way it goes. It's just like, it's part of the job. You mm -hmm. know, it's like you're putting yourself out there. There's going to be challenges. There's, you know, the country, the land, um, the weather, you never know. And so it's, it's going to happen just like, you know, you can't control those plane crash. And I don't know why why Jim crashed? What happened with his plane? Do you know? You know, I don't know any, um, I, I don't know all the actual things. I know I think there's been some reports, but it, I, I, I couldn't say yeah. with positivity. Uh, last night I got picked up from the airport, the Uber driver, uh, older gentleman who was a pilot. He has his own plane. He flies around everybody, he drops skydivers and this and that, but he, he's, his, uh, a guy he works with knew Jim. And he brought up Jim. Really? And he didn't know him personally, but he loved watching the show, of course, and yeah. Flying Wild Alaska. And, uh, you know, just he talked about it. And, you know, I had talked with some of the guys there and uh, one of the guys that was on the ground, but he, he wasn't watching when the plane took off. But it was just kind of like messing with camp. It took off and the plane had just, he had already done one load out of there. Mm -hmm. And that popped right off the ridge, you know, yeah. big deal. And yeah. a lot of those ridges, as you know, they're up higher. Yeah. Because one speculation was saying oh, maybe he hit a tree, oh. and it was like, well, I don't, I don't know think there was trees, trees up there. there so no. why was he down there though? Yeah, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. And Jim's not a showboater, right? So you know what I mean. He wasn't like showboating yeah. around, dropping yeah. off the ridge, trying to do so. So I don't know. And I'm not a pilot, so I can't. I can't say. But I just, I personally felt like there was either a catastrophic failure in the mm -hmm. plane or or maybe a, a health problem that happened with, with Jim. Who knows? Yeah. We don't, I, I don't know. Right. Um, but I just know it was a very, very, very bad, bad crash mm -hmm. and they were dead instantly. Yeah. So, cause, uh, mm. my buddy ran down there immediately afterwards and they mm. were gone. So, 
you know, so it's just hard to say. And like I say, I've flown off those ridges with Jim many a times um, years ago and uh, excellent pilot. Yeah. You know, so um, it, it, there may be a report. I just haven't I just haven't read it, you know, um, but uh, and normally the wind on those ridges, it allows you to pop up pretty quick, mm -hmm. you know, because they mm -hmm. use that wind to, yeah. to get up. But yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, it's hard to say, you know, um, yeah, just just one of those one of those tough deals that happens um, all the time. It seems like in Alaska, where some of it's uh, a lot a lot of crashes are due to the pilot, mm -hmm. and then some are catastrophic yeah. failures of some sort. You know, but just like with anything, a lot of these pilots are you know they read all these reports so they can figure out how to handle these situations right. when it does happen, right? Yeah. And um, uh, it's just like with us with dealing with bears or sheep goats up in nasty trains how do we deal with these situations when they arise uh if something of an emergency comes up mm -hmm. or how do we stay out of this situation uh so an emergency doesn't come up you yeah. know but ultimately over the years things are going to happen you know we've had guys have heart attacks out there um guys falling i've fallen you know thought i've broken stuff over the years but it's just a matter of <laughs> Is there a pilot, Jim Lechner? Is he's did he, did he die? He was up there in Kodiak. He was who me and Roy Lechner. used. Lechner. There was a Lechner, but or it's maybe not it's Jim. Jack. Jack Lechner. Jack. I, you know, I want to say he is still alive, but not flying. I oh. believe. But yeah, he would. Well, yeah, I think he's still around, but I could be wrong. I'm, I'm probably we, thinking of another guy. He may have passed, but I'm not 100% yeah. sure on that. But yeah, he was an interesting guy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I never got to fly with him, but I heard a lot of really cool yeah. and interesting stories. Yeah, it was just like, I, I just never forget when you think you're supposed to get picked up, so you're laying there and you're just listening for every plane, yep. you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. oh my God, seems like time could never go slower. Yeah, and every little you're sitting there and you're trying to hear it first. Yeah, you know, is that wind or is that a is that a plane? Yeah, and guys will be sitting there, planes coming. I'm like, dude, that's a C-130 flying over. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> that that's is a for military us. plane yeah. flying over. That's not for us. Uh, oh, no, okay. Yeah, there's no other quite feeling of desperation when you're waiting to get picked up. The hunt's done or whatever. Or it's like, okay, we're out of here, but need the plane. Well, our guys the other day, you know. Um, guy was waiting and like planes coming in and a big rain squall comes in so the guy to like turn i mean the, he's in the valley and this huge squall came that was like super windy and the guy turned around and so they yeah. wait another day they're like ah the plane's oh, right, there. right there and they'd already been stuck a couple of days so well, and that's just kind of the the way it goes right i don't uh, know if you remember that story where roy and dwight shoe were on kodiak and they got stuck for like i think it was 21 days oh because they were oh. where they were hunting, they had to land on the river. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the river froze, so yeah. you know they're landing on floats on the river, and it's just like. Do you remember what year that was? Uh, let me think. Um, I know I hate being called out. Like, what year was that? It's like oh, crap, I know I never could remember the because we went through a couple of really it was bad probably freezes. Like Twenty twelve. Mm hmm. Yeah, because there were some really really bad. I remember there were some bad winds, and then it got really cold. People were froze up in places, and uh, that's prop. Yeah, man, that may have been 2011, yeah. 2012. Yep. yep, maybe 2010. I don't know, but they were stuck for. I just remember the story that you know the pilot came in, was going to bring him food, and dropped a ba uh, bag of food. Couldn't land, mm -hmm. but. Dropped a bag of food and Roy said they're expecting like pizza or something like that and it was yams. <laughs> it was from, canned yams from from uh, Lechner. I don't. I I can't remember if it was him or not yams. at that time. But it's like yeah, let's drop them yams. We yeah, couldn't find it anything was just else. Something crazy. It's just like what, this is what because they've been eating deer for oh know, yeah for three weeks basically. Yeah. But yeah, I mean that's the risk of Kodiak. It's like you. You Always know. take extra food, to extra fuel, and um, it is kind of comical though because you know these pilots are doing their best. You yeah. know they really are, and they got to be cautious. And the, these you'll hear the stories because we we plan on you know potentially staying in there uh, days more. Yeah, and uh, the stories oh we're out of food, we're out of food. How many deer did you shoot? You know, and of course, 
oh, we've got six deer. And it's like, okay, you're not out of food, dude. <laughs> You've got fuel. you yeah. got food. You're going to need to eat some deer. Okay. Right. And they're yeah. like, yeah, but well, we just need to really get in. Yeah, we know. Yeah. Everyone needs to get in. Yeah. We know you're frozen. So is everyone else. Right. So, <laughs> I know. It's, it's the real deal when you go up there. You got to have good tents. You got to have good gear. You got to have plenty of food and fuel. And it's just one of those, one of those things. And you I know. don't know. I was going to ask, you said that. You said a recurve guy shot the bear in the head, but did you say that was going to be like a world record? Uh, yeah, because it was twenty nine and change at the time, and that that uh, at the moment it was twenty eight and five sixteenths or whatever. So it, it would have been over. Yeah, is that the biggest bear you've killed? Um, no, because in two thousand eighteen, um, my buddy Chris Kamak actually shot the world record on the peninsula with me. Oh, did he? Yeah, so for archery, and so that was. The record was 29 and 3 sixteenths, and his was 29 and uh, 5, and then it dried 4 sixteenths, so it dried oh. 1 sixteenth less, <laughs> which we were all like pins and needles, that, and so it beat the current one at uh, by a sixteenth. Wow. So is it the cur current world record? Yeah, still oh, is the man. current world and you record. you guided it. Mm -hmm. Oof, that's but, awesome. You know, uh, honestly, and I, people could think I'm being cocky about it or whatever, but I am the best. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. But what I was going to say is it wasn't uh, throughout my guiding, of, you know, with bow hunters and starting my first bow hunt I was on was probably like 2003, four. Uh, when it happened, it was like, all right, we got it. Cool. I mean, I was surprised, but it wasn't like. Like, I can't believe this. It yeah. was just, it honestly, in my brain, I was like, okay, we got it. Like, it was just like the goal. I knew yeah. we would, it, I just felt like we knew we would get it. Right. Yeah. It would just, because. You just did what you're supposed to do. The thing is, we on on our bear hunts, the thing is, you're, you're hunting mature, large mature boars, okay? And with targeting those types of animals, of which that's what the biologist would like you to take, mm -hmm. you know, some of them want a well-rounded harvest, but uh, most of the ones, and especially for us guides, are our targets are large, mature boars. Mm -hmm. And when you're a bow hunting guide, that I don't treat them any different than a rifle guy. Than a rifle guy, mm -hmm. some bow hunting outfitters say you're going to shoot the first bear we can get up on. If it's a single bear, that's what you're going to have to shoot. Well, why? Yeah. If you know how to hunt them and can get up on, you know, uh, the situations, we don't we don't need to make some sort of adjustment. Mm -hmm. First side, we're just we'll just wait for a, a large mature bear. Yeah. Um, and so with with doing that, the outcome is you're you're killing really old boars for the most part, and those old boars have large skulls mm -hmm. and obviously very large bodies. Um, and so it just kind of comes with it. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah. just like anything. If you're going to shoot young animals, you can't expect them to be in their prime. Right. And if you're hunting old, mature animals, you could get a world record. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just one of those things. It's not like we were, we knew nothing of that bear. Yeah. We were not hunting a world record bear. We're just hunting big, a big, big male male. Yeah. And I had no clue it was that big because the thing is with bears, those skulls are within, obviously within the skin. And there's you can have a lot of fur on the edge yeah. of, your, of your heads where they look really wide or appear really long or you know, vice versa. Really they can know. have a big overbite, underbite. Yeah. So how you're measuring those skulls. So that's how you would classify world record bears by skull, mm -hmm. right? And I'm saying this for the audience, uh, is you take the length and width of the skull, add it together, and that is how you get your measurement. 28 inches is Boone and Crockett or um, like record class. Uh, and I don't even know what Pope and Young is, but it's pretty small to make, I, th I think. Like at least on yeah. Kodiak, what I mean is most single boars are going to be are going to be in Pope and yeah. Young. It's yeah. set pretty low. Might be 22 or 21 even. Something. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, you're going to get in Pope and Young, but the, but like the, you know, 28 is what Boone and Crockett is for like rifle or mm -hmm. just any of that, that type of deal. But uh, regardless, um, a lot of those old, older mature bears are all in the 27s to, you know, high 27s. And then you get in the 28s, but 
the thing is I have the very first recurve bear that we got with the guy built his own bow and arrows and everything. Um, shot it there on Kodiak. I, when I watched that bear, we watched it for like two days before we got him killed. I thought 100% sure this would be the world record mm. because it had like arthritis in his hips. Like he looked very, he wasn't injured. Mm-hmm. He was just, he, he was ancient, just old, yeah. ancient. And I thought this is as big as they get. He's, he's, you know, right at 10 foot, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. And when the hunter got a shot off and, you know, killed the bear, uh, you know, he was 27 and three sixteenths. That's all that bear's ever going to be. It's just yeah. his genetics, just yeah. like some people, right? Yeah. Not everyone's going to be six, five, right? right? Um, maybe you'll grow there eventually. <laughs> Probably. I, I'm almost there, but, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. but, uh, it's just one of those things. And so you never know, Yeah. but you, the whole goal is it doesn't matter. It's just the old mature animals we're going for. Yeah. Same thing with goats. I don't really care how long the horns are. I'm, I'm trying to harvest old mature billies. Right. And a lot of them have, you know, worn, chipped off horns and whatnot. But man, when they're 300, 350 pound animals, you know, huge glands behind the horns and they're just, you know, very mature. Yeah. That's what you're going for. Yeah. It doesn't matter if it's Kill nine them. inches, eight and a half, whatever. Yeah. It's just a very, very old, you know, animal. So with bears, it is the outcome of hunting old mature animals and it just so happened to be mm-hmm. a world record you yeah know? and that's so awesome. um i keep saying we're gonna bring that's on the alaska peninsula and about every single bow hunter i take out i call chris say well hope you've enjoyed having it <laughs> <clears throat> it's gonna change are the bigger bear on the peninsula right now um kodiak has it i mean i've taken more boone and crockett bears on on kodiak oh, okay uh, they're both great areas. Like our areas are both spectacular. But peninsula, you don't need to draw, right? It's it is a registration over yeah. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yep, you don't have to draw on the Alaska Peninsula. They're both amazing. And of course, here's the deal: mm-hmm. if you're an outfitter and that's where your area is on the Alaska Peninsula, you're of course going to say yeah, it's, the best. it's the best area. <laughs> if you're on Kodiak, of course, Kodiak is the best area. Yeah. They're both spectacular. They're both magical. You know, they're both really, really impressive. I just try to uh, line up hunters and take them to, number one, where we have an opening. Number two, we have some guys that just want to hunt the peninsula or want to hunt Kodiak. Mm. Some guys have hunted the peninsula first, and now we want to hunt Kodiak. Yeah. It's a, you know, Kodiak is a majestic yeah. place. It's magical, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but both Renowned. of them are really, really cool. You know, they're both amazing. And, and it's funny because... You know, every single guy, when you walk up to a booth and you're looking at the photo book and they're like, wow, 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 those are big bears, man, I wish, and then you book the hunt and you're out there and you're like, gosh, and you're out there five days and I wish, man, I wish I got a bear like that guy. Man, I wish I had that guy's luck. I'm like, you realize every single guy <laughs> has thought the exact same thing on this pamphlet here. Yeah. They all were like down in the dumps for the right. most part. Very rare does it happen just so yeah. fast. Everyone's in great spirits. And then you go shoot your bear, it's done. It's very rare. Most yeah. of them are like, dang. You got to earn it. Yeah, they've had to earn it, the highs and lows, and all of a sudden it, it just happens because bear hunting is a lot of boredom, you know. It's yeah. just, yeah, what, what do they say, like 90% boredom, 10% sheer terror, whatever it is. But it's, I know throughout the years you just get this confidence, and the only time that I get nervous is when the when I can hear the plane coming. Mm. Like if a guy hasn't got a bear, yeah. it's like, ooh. Whoops. <laughs> and that happens, you know, we don't, we don't but do. But up until then, you never know. Yeah. You never know. It can happen within a, within an instant. How many, know. how many bears have you killed now? I don't know. Um, it's uh, the only reason why I would know, because I didn't really like having to keep track. Cause I, did, I mean, I just, it's like, Oh, what's my kill count? I didn't think it was very mm. respectful, but when we were doing our federal prospectus and having to write in for federal areas and, and, uh, for the state for guiding areas, you have to like count up all your stuff and uh, submit everything yeah. to them. And it's pushing right at a hundred, mm. but you know, I've done way more hunts and a lot of, you know, there was a lot of unsuccessful hunts yeah, and I mean, then I, you have you, cause I, that's, that is the thing about, uh, guiding bow hunters. Yeah. A lot of unsuccessful hunts. There's no guarantee. But I get that respectful. I mean, I don't know how many bulls I've killed, Mm -hmm. you know, because it's just like the counting the numbers. It's like, I agree. It 
are you chasing numbers or mm -hmm. are you respecting each life? You know what I yep. mean? So I, I get that. I was just, I just know, um, sheep guys, I just, I've heard a lot of guys talk about, they know exactly how many they've got. Yeah. So I didn't know. Right. If, if Actually, it, it's funny because, uh, you know, there's been years where I'm like, yeah, I probably kill it, but I really honestly didn't know. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and I think it's pretty common. People just throw out numbers and they're like, Oh, I guess I really haven't taken that many <laughs> hmm. or vice versa. Like, yeah, Oh, I didn't yeah. know I've actually taken that many. So, but, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. I mean, I've, I don't know how many hunts I've guided, but there's, there's probably, <laughs> there's several unsuccessful hunts in there. And that's just the way it goes when you're yeah. hunting, when you're hunting and it's a hundred percent fair chase, you're booking a hunting trip. Mm -hmm. You're not booking a kill. Yeah. You know? Um, and so, uh, it doesn't make it any easier if someone doesn't get something, but it happens. You know, I had a guy this spring not get a bear bow hunting. He's been with us. It's funny. I go, gosh, dang, man, it's been a long time since I haven't gotten a bear. And he's in a great attitude, great spirits. And I said, wait a second. You're the last guy I didn't get a bear with. <laughs> he's like, gosh, dang it. Yeah, you're right. And he goes, you know, my daughter says I'm on, I'm, uh, uh, not very good luck. And I was like, oh, well, thanks for telling me. <laughs> but just great spirits and stuff. Yeah, but it's like, I mean, good. for rifle hunting, you could have shot them. But the thing is, people have to understand, if you're going to come on a archery brown bear hunt or archery hunt where you could pick up a rifle, yeah, I mean, you are choosing to handicap yourself. Make it tougher, yeah. Make it tougher. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your guy's trying to do his job and getting you within 100 yards, 50 yards, you know, 20 yards, whatever, it's that's just the way bow hunting goes sometimes, yeah. man. I mean, I've been like I was telling you earlier, we've been within ten yards, fifteen yards, and not get a shot off. Yeah. I have some heartbreaking footage of guys full drawn, getting ready to touch that release on giant bear and just <whistles> gone. Wind, something, saw yeah. us, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh God. Yeah, that is heartbreaking. I've already got that bear skinned. He's that, mounted. I'm get you know the biggest tip in the world after killing this bear. That thing gone. That it's, doesn't happen on rifle hunts. You know, I mean, not too often. <laughs> no, it's like if they're there, you're gonna get it. Probably get a bullet in them. But when bow hunting, yeah, so much can go wrong. Um, I was gonna say, you know, being a, a bear guide on Kodiak is kind of one of the most legendary type professions. It's like what type of do you know the history of guides on Kodiak? And like, do, is there, is there people you've looked up to mm -hmm. that have done your job and like that are legends? Yeah. I mean, from like the early days, like the Madsons, like there's some good books out there, uh, like the early, early guiding, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, Harry Dodge wrote a book. It's still out there, still available. Kodiak and its bears, lots of history. I mean, we're talking like plate tectonics on how it, how Kodiak was formed the native history, mm. uh, natives and Russians coming over, um, uh, then the early guiding in like Madsons and very early days. He's got a lot of bios of like early guides mm. and a lot of the native guides that were, that were very good guides. And so, but like Madsons were like really, really cool, uh, very respected, uh, very renowned guides. Then you, then you had the Pinnell and Tallifson, uh, the, the Brown Bear Men books, those are really cool, really neat old books to read. Mm -hmm. um, lots of historical things. And just those are so important, I feel, because just reading those stories, that's the thing that people kind of discount now is like reading history yeah. about hunting. Guess what? Hunting has been hunting for a long time on these things. Mm -hmm. You can read and learn a lot of things and learn a lot of mistakes that people made or really good things that they made or did and learned, um, it will save you a lot of time. And so I love reading those old stories, but a lot of them are really funny too. The hilarious yeah. client stories. That's, those are the best, like the weird clients you get and stuff. But, uh, but no, like moving up to Kodiak, I was very, very fortunate to talk with, uh, Mr. Dick Rohr, who runs a legendary camp. Um, actually turns 80 on Friday mm. this week. And, uh, he is a legend when it comes to bear guides, he's still out there doing stuff. His mm. son runs a camp now, Sam, and he's our Alaska Professional Hunters Association president. Um, but uh, they run a, an amazing camp. And uh, Dick was, he's always been, like he was the first guy to talk with me mm. when I was in high school. I asked my aunt, do you know any guides up here in Kodiak I could talk to? Uh, 
And uh, she goes, you know, I know um, the people that own the subway, their dad is a bear guide. That's all she said. She's like, maybe I can ask him. So here she is at Subway. Hey, do you think your dad would talk to, you know, my nephew when he comes up? Yeah, yeah, tell him to call him. So uh, he he said, yeah, come on over to the house. I'll talk with you. So I was up on a deer hunt my senior year of high school. And so I wanted to figure out what I need to do when I move up. Yeah. So he sat down with me, had a cup of coffee, and kind of explained guiding to me. Mm. And he said, first off, you need to move up here to Alaska. Be an Alaskan resident. Put your time in. You know, dedicate your time to Alaska. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm doing that. I will. And he goes, okay, well, this, you know, you, you have to be a packer for this amount of time. You have to be an assistant guide. Then you can become a registered guide. Because I do nothing yeah. on, like, the legalities of guiding. Right. I just thought... I'll just move up there and become a guide, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so he laid out kind of uh, steps of to become a guide. And uh, and then, uh, you know, when I moved up there, uh, you know, within two days, or no, I got off the ferry and I called him and said, hey, Mr. Roar, this is Cole Kramer from, you know, moving up from Missouri. Uh, I'm here. And he goes, oh, okay, you moved. I said, yep, I'm here. Uh, he <laughs> goes, when did you graduate? I said, a week ago. And he's like, wow, okay. So I, I'm up there. And he goes, all right, well, thanks for letting me know. Then he called me back like an hour later. Hey, we're going to camp. Um, if you want to come out and and we're going to do some chores before the fishermen come in a month. And so we're going to paint and dig a water line out house holes and stuff. You're welcome to come. You're not going to get paid, but if you want to come out, you're welcome to. You can talk to my son. He's the guy. Okay, cool. Sounds good. So I went out there uh, for a week just doing chores and hanging out and, you know, asking tons of questions. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he's like, Hey, I don't really have a place for you, but we'll help you get placed Mm -hmm. to be a packer somewhere. And then they introduced me to the outfitter I've worked with for, I still work with Paul for 21 years, Paul Shervenak up there. And, uh, he's been like a dad to me pretty Mm -hmm. much and an excellent mentor, you know, from day one, it was always, uh, teaching me how to run a business, Mm -hmm. not you're my guide, Right. Uh, you're Not my slave down. and yeah. and uh, worker. It always was about okay. When you're gonna run your own operation, you need to uh, you need to do this. This is how we do the paperwork. This is how we do, you know. And I found that out kind of early on. That was rare, right? Because mm-hmm. I just thought, wow, this is really nice of them to show me all this stuff. Okay. And then if I went to go work for another outfitter, I'd say, hey, so blah, 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 asking about paperwork type of things. And I'm like, (laughs) why aren't you asking this? Like, you don't need to know this. You know, this is kind of confidential stuff. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. I didn't know. I just, this is the way I was brought up over here. Mm -hmm. So I learned very quickly that the people that I met early on, I was very fortunate. They were very, very good guys. And anything um, that I had questions on, I could just ask them, Mm -hmm. you know, whether between... Mr. Rohr or, or Paul, of which uh, Paul didn't have any kids, so he called me his son in Alaska, you know, mm-hmm. and actually we're neighbors. I bought a house right next door to him, oh, so really? he washed it over my house and everything And when I'm gone. And he's just a great guy, you mm-hmm. know, great individual. And um, But, uh, you know, there's so there's a lot of mentors that I had along the way. I wasn't just, uh, oh, I did everything on my own. I have everything to, to thank them for helping me out mm-hmm. along the way. Uh, because, you know, as we all can look back, like, man, how did I get here? Yeah. And I'm really, I wouldn't change a thing on like the people I had involved in my life. You know, we can learn a lot from books and, and everything, but man, it, it's really a blessing when you actually have people in your lives that you, you take the time and those people see that you're taking the time and then they will invest in you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and if you don't, you know, these employers and, and whatnot. If you don't take initiative and and show them that you are there, you know, no matter what you do, if you it, you know if you if you're not showing them that you are committed to their to your job and what you're doing, your profession, um, if you're not showing them, they're not they're they're yeah. not going to invest upon you. But right. they will, and especially nowadays, if you're a committed person, I don't care who you are, what you look like, you know, uh, man or woman, you it's I hate to say it, I mean it's kind of rare. You know, anyway, if you show that you have good, hardworking efforts, you will yeah. go a very, very long ways. Do you care? Do you care about this? Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. If you care, it's unbelievable how, how far mm-hmm. you will go with, with this. So you talked about, you know, you used to like to read the stories and learn a lot. So how are you documenting all your experiences? Oh, man. Man, I wish I could say I had uh, journals. <laughs> a journal Detailed from day one. Journals. I had some, and I started early on doing some journaling. 
And, uh, and I was advised by a guy I actually was guiding in Australia some years back and a guy uh, who actually lived up in Soldotna, Alaska. He told me, he goes, write it down, write it down, young man. You're going to, he goes, you'll think that you can remember it, but you can't. Yeah. He goes, you need to write it down. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's hard, you yeah. know, it, for me, but Next I know time. it, it, you need to. And, and I, and I love it. Um, seeing like these, you know, these old guides who are kind of getting out of it, they'll write a book. Mm -hmm. And I love getting those books and, yeah. and reading their stories. And Me I too. think, uh, you know, it's like with military guys, some of their military uh, peers apparently get uh, frustrated if some guy writes a book or whatever branch they're in, this and that, and the other. But it's like, hey, man, that's this guy's experience. Yeah. This is his life. Right. I look at it like I had, I had a group of guys uh, come in and we were training in August and uh, they're still active. Uh, and we were talking about the books thing and and how they didn't like how some guys did this and some guys that. And I said, you know what, guys, here's the deal. You guys are thinking about your your community, but what about those guys' kids? Mm -hmm. What about the grandkids? I would love to read a book that my grandfather wrote. Right. And if it was, it, I mean, I would write it. Sure, you can do it in a tactful, tasteful manner. You know, not you're not bragging about yourself, but you're just documenting your, your time and what you did in your profession. And... Um, and it's like writing it in a way that you're telling it to your kids, you know, uh, because it's hard. You don't always know what what you've done. I mean, you're, you're close with your kids, mm -hmm. right? They get to see, but it's also like, but they don't know your internal thoughts right. all the time. And it's really, it'd be really cool. And obviously you wrote your book and that's mm -hmm. awesome because I, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book and whatnot, but it's cool because then you get to write down your thoughts mm -hmm. and people don't always see that. And, 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 or hear it, whatever. Right. Yeah. And so the, those, uh, I've always thought it was really cool. No matter what you do, I think it would be, it's pretty cool, especially when you get to that time, it, it'd be a pretty cool thing to, to, to write a book with, with all your, your adventures. And frankly, to me, I, uh, I, we're, I'm a guide. I'm supposed to be successful. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my job. Yeah, but it's the it's the hilarious stuff and the goofy freaking <laughs> well, clients that we have. Your stories would, <laughs> would be epic in a book. I yeah. mean, because I I don't know. Have you read Silver Tip? It's a uh, Paul Schaefer. It's about Paul Schaefer, but okay. he also hunted. They hunted Kodiak, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's Silver Tip Recurves, mm -hmm. and that's oh, yeah. Paul Schaefer's yep. that started that that company. But then he hunted also with. Roy told me about this guy, Bart Shiler, mm -hmm. and he used to work at Foster's Taxidermy up with where oh, Roy, yeah. Roy mm -hmm. went. And uh, they hunted Kodiak a lot. So there's a lot of stories about Kodiak in there, which is why it made me think about, do you follow history or what do you yep. read? But those stories, it's like, I don't know, your stories would have to be, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I want you to journal them because I, yeah. I want to read about this stuff. And you've been doing it 21 years. You're you're only 40 now. Could you imagine the amount of story, epic stories you'd have? It would be a classic book. But yep. you're right; it's hard to remember every all the details. Yeah. You no, know? and you're correct. And I and I keep wanting to do like kind of make up a format page of where like you just kind of fill it in each day with the questions, this, yeah. that, the other, whether it, because also it's for your area because we t we do keep some logs at times for like where we're seeing bears because i work with fishing games from the time on on surveys and whatnot and the time that where they're at time you know uh, the uh visibility weather conditions all sorts of whatever um and so it it is important i think like you said uh, there it, it, just even for myself because even looking back on what i have journaled it's kind of hilarious to see what i wrote at times and it's like i forget you know and i'm reading <laughs> yeah. a book like a new book yeah. sometimes like oh wow i can't oh, i forgot about that yeah but it was cool this last like say this uh, year or two ago when we had to re-up permits and whatnot i had to go through and like relive and look at a lot of different things mm -hmm. since 2002 I was like, oh, wow, yeah, that was a lot that happened there. Yeah. But I've, you know, um, 
it's just one of those one of those things. Someday I will, but I but I I love it. And I encourage anyone and everyone to like, hey, because I know number one, it's like pretty therapeutic for people just to it sit is, down. Yeah. I know it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Yeah, but the the storytelling part, and you know, you have you said around a hundred bears. It's like every experience of that, there has mm-hmm. to be something in there yeah. that stands out or you could learn from or people would be interested in. It's like. And storytelling is what keeps hunting alive. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. you talked about, you loved hearing the stories from the old timers. Yeah. I loved hearing Jack Frost, hearing oh, those yeah. stories. So it's like, you're not the old timer yet, but a hundred bear. I mean, that's epic. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Guys will reach out to me about a sheep hunt or a bear. I post something and someone will reach out. Hey, would you mind writing a story on that? And I say, yeah. Man, honestly, it just, we flew in there. We, it worked out perfect. I don't really have much of a story for you. We just got in there and shot this thing. I was like, but maybe you should ask this guy because I'm pretty sure that was the most epic adventure of his life. <laughs> yeah. I don't really have the good story for you, but I think that guy probably will have a better story for you. Yeah. Because as a professional, you're, I mean, you're not numb to it, of course. You, right. I think it's, you get to, uh, very cognitive of it, but it's, it's different. It's different. Yeah. Right. And so it's, it's interesting to see it through a different lens of a person's first time and the excitement. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's just stuff like say, just because we shot a giant Ram doesn't mean that it was this, the most epic stock ever. Yeah. You know, but you remember, like, I remember the first bull I shot at, I didn't know if I could pull my bow back. My mm-hmm. arms felt like they were asleep, <laughs> right? And so now I don't, now I'm like, whatever. Yeah. But at that time, so that's, that, how I felt on that first bull was how your your hunters feel with that first bear. Oh, yeah. You know, and so, yeah, to, to you, of course you're not. You've been through it so many times, but... Yeah, I don't know. I just I just love the history of hunting and the yep. you know, the history of what we do. Well, and it's in the way you have to look at it. Like I say, it's not just it's not for us potentially right now. It's yeah. for, for further future. on down mm-hmm. and in the future. Yeah. Um and so that is the thing and once again for the future, uh like I look at it for other guides and what to expect and to let them know like, hey man, this stuff's been happening for a long time. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. This isn't anything different you're going through. This has been happening forever. <laughs> and the other big thing is like for young guides thinking they got it hard. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah. are you joking? Go back and read the Brown Bear Men and the Pinel, or like the Pinell and Talfson books and like looking at these packers that were wearing cotton and snowshoeing oh, up and over mountains to get a, you know, 150 pound, 200 pound hideout, yeah. you know? And I mean, with a pack board, you know, yeah. and we're, we're, we got the best, we've got it. Yeah. The, well, the best it's ever been. Right. We've got the best gear, the best boots, the best anything and everything. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine the actual weight difference. Oh. Of crazy. what? Yeah. If, I mean, I'm pretty sure someone has it somewhere. We could probably Google. But like, if you have a guy, the normal bear hunter with the wool, and then like the rubber, rubber boots, or uh, just big pack boots, or something, and then his pack frame, uh, backboard, and whatever, and this weighed this, then now what we have now with yeah. all of our gear in there, <laughs> probably it's, probably half the weight they had at least, you know. Yeah, and uh, so it, I I love reading some of those old stories, and, and I love reading like mountaineering books and whatnot, and um, and just uh, and some of the names are, are spacing me right now, but like just realizing that man, men have suffered a very long time doing these adventures and they don't just give up. They push through, yeah. they endure and they, and you learn a lot about yourself when you're out there. And especially with guiding and, um, young guys knowing that it's like, Hey man, don't worry, you'll get through this. Okay. And then once you're done, you're, you're continuously setting these, these benchmarks. Mm-hmm. I remember like with sheep hunting, that was like some of the toughest things I'd ever done in my early days. And I just remember, like, you know, we'd be packing out of somewhere, and I'd be like, all right. Well, that was the longest pack out I've done. That was, <laughs> you know, 16 miles. Okay. That was a long pack out. That was a heavy load. Mm-hmm. We made it. And then it'd be like, okay, that one was 20. Okay. That one was 24. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. And it's just like, boom, boom. But there's all these hard situations, you know, like Kodiak. We have issues with areas freezing up all the time. And mm-hmm. I don't, and, I've had to pack out 
camps for nine guys, like deer camps and stuff, were like nine of us total, and packing it miles and miles along the frozen shores and rocks and in ice and and it's taken us a week to get our gear out. Had to cancel a trip because everything's froze up, and it's just got to get our gear out. And yeah. it's like, well, might as well just pack yeah. it out. Yeah. And and it's like, well, we got through that. All right. <laughs> and it's just those are like the cool things. But then you read about, uh, uh, dang, there's a couple amazing mountaineering books. But there's some that where they did the first expeditions of some of these mountains and summits, where it would take them um, just a month just to portage their gear mm -hmm. to the base of the mountain and yeah, then amazing. another month to get it up to like the base camp and then another you know whatever and it's just old 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 school gear and i'm yeah. like okay i'm worried about packing gear for three days <laughs> or four days like yeah they it pack for a month to get to months, the base uh you know yeah. and it's just like in like the old guide stories, like I said, you yeah, know, like those are, them. those are, those are just, but you need to have these stories. Yeah. See? Someday I will. Yeah. But <laughs> I, it's hard to, like, you almost feel like you can't live up to that sort of stuff, you know, but yeah. it's, you know, because I'm a fake, you yeah. know, at any, any moment we're going to be exposed, right? <sighs> we're both just freaking yeah posers posers man <laughs> and so the book will will expose me on how much of a poser i am <laughs> yeah i had had to stay out overnight once yeah no and that's the thing the the books the, the 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 you know the goal of something like that is to educate and the stories the funny things yeah um, and just the, the stories because like I say it's pretty cool for you because uh you know your grandkids your kids, obviously, they see it, but like grandkids, great grandkids, you know, that's the thing I look at. It's going to be pretty cool to, to be able to look back at what grandpa did because I wish, I just wish that my grandparents had done such a thing. Yeah. You know, my grandpa was an electrician. The other one was just a, you know, a farmer. Yeah. You know, but, but I would, I would love to read a story about them. Yeah. But, you know, you know, your, your experiences, the biggest adventures and, you know, some of the biggest adventures in the world the biggest bear in the world in the most epic country in the world. That's special. So I just want you to, I want to read that. I All want right. to read your experiences. Cause I love, I love sitting down and talking about them and I, you know, I love reading about them, but I like hearing them. I like all of it. And, you know, Joe killed that bull yesterday. He sent me this big, long text with the details of the wind and, the, mm -hmm. and, you know, took his boots off and two pairs of wool socks. And it's just like, yeah, that never gets it. Ne and that that was an elk hunt in California, mm -hmm. which there's no life or death anything. So, but it's still so it's still fun. It's still people people. I put it up, and people said, "Oh man, I felt like I was there." Mm -hmm. So that's how that's hunting. Yeah, you know, I mean, we need to, we need to take the reader with us and yeah. share that. It's so important. Well, and it's cool because also when you think about it, you know, Joe's been hunting for. I mean, several years now, right? Yeah, but 10 years probably. 10 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's cool when you think about, okay, if you had a new hunter, all right, now sit down and really think about what you did. Yeah. And write write mm -hmm. a story. Yeah. Write your story because it actually makes you like think about, wow, okay, the wind was doing this. It felt like this. I noticed that I noticed these birds off to the side, you know, then I noticed this buck over here and there's yeah. all these different things that are going yeah. through your brain and and those are the interests it's not just the okay we knocked the arrow moved from one bush to the next bush and we shot it like there's just a lot that no, goes on that you're you, immersed in it yeah and and i think it's yeah. pretty cool to to see that and we can go through life here on the outside in town not being immersed in shit you know what i mean so when you're out there and you're immersed in it because you have to be if you're going to kill if you're going to be a hunter if you're going to be successful you have to be able to notice all those little details mm -hmm. and still read the animal and still read the wind but it's like it's everything and that's like so empowering but to be able to share that too is pretty special mm -hmm. but anyway all right I'm, i'll work on that I'll, all right I'll, i'm gonna <laughs> i'll start working on that it may take me several years but uh, if nothing else in your captions you know i mean yeah. i think you do a good job of sharing sharing different parts of that so i mean instagram is valuable for that if nothing else yeah yeah you know? and you know that's the thing it's almost like i'm sure it annoys some people like just post your picture and got it done but like <laughs> I, I feel like you're doing a disservice I if don't, you, don't like, you know, there's just, and that's cool if people don't want to get in their details, but like, I, don't I like, like knowing, you know. Yeah. I saw, I see captions sometimes where they'll say stuff like, uh, 
got on the board, you know, or, and I'm like, this isn't, we're not scoring shit. Mm -hmm. What do you mean got on the board? What is this contest with who's, who's playing this game, you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't, so I don't like the, just, you know, put one through the pump house. What? I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I like how Joe did it. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? I like giving reverence to the moment and to the, to the experience. I do understand. It's like, whatever people can do, whatever they want. That's fine. I prefer reading what happened, you know, let's hear about it. Let's, what were you thinking? But anyway, I agree. (laughs) I agree with you. Do you have, uh, so do you have anything amazing coming up? You're going to potentially write another book. What's in the, uh, what's in the hopper for you? Yeah. I just agreed to another book actually yesterday. Really? Um, Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, I gotta get to work on that. (laughs) So do you like doing that? I mean, um, you've been writing for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I like, uh, I think as we talked about storytelling is important Mm -hmm. and it, you know, the first book did impact a lot of people. Yep. Um, so this one will be, that one was about indoors, you know, just whatever it takes, you just get through it, hard work, you can achieve whatever you want. This one will be called undeniable. So it's like, how do you, how do you stay? How do you, keep producing you know Mm -hmm. it's not just accomplishing a goal and then you're done it's just like how do you become undeniable so that's what this one will be about but yeah i mean it's it is it's just you know we're storytellers that's just what we do so it's uh i think it's important i think that's what keeps society engaged and um wanting more and growing Mm -hmm. well yeah like it or not there's a lot of people inspired by you oh so well, thank you <laughs> believe it or not i don't i don't know if you know that but it blows my mind that of how uh, how you've been able to reach across the lines of you know so many people that aren't into hunting whatsoever all the runners and mm-hmm. just athletic people that uh, i mean you are the you are the hunting spokesperson basically oh, so you, you do you do a, a damn good job and uh just got to keep it up and like you say it's pretty undeniable i remember you know i remember when you and i were talking about sheep hunting yeah and you you were um saying you were gonna run a hundred and then you're gonna run your first 200 yes and and you're like yeah i want to come um, sheep hunting with you and we, so we were talking about that and uh and i was like you said, I only got five days. Yeah, after the 200. After, and I go, oh, after what? I go, <laughs> yeah. is it just called the 200? Like, no, we run 200 miles. And I was like, oh, yeah. have you done that before? You're like, uh, no. Yeah, and that I was like, I was like, is that what that was? Yeah. yeah. So, so I remember I texted you because you ran the 100. Yeah. And that was, was you had ran 100 before? I had, I had done 100 before. Yeah. But yeah, this but was I, my first 200 coming yeah, up. Yeah. And then, so I texted you, though, after the 100. I yeah. was like, how you feel it? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, man. well, I, you're like, and I, I mean, obviously you did it, but I, you're like, I was thinking about that sheep hunt, man. <laughs> that, that may be a little rough to do after yeah. that because you were literally gonna get done with that. Is it 240? Is that what it no, was? It Bigfoot or what? The 205. Yeah, it was 205 Bigfoot. Bigfoot. Yeah. yeah. So you were literally going to get done with that. And you were going to fly the next day yeah. and we were going to have five days to kill a ram. And I was like, dang, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, I mean, uh, honestly, I, okay. N- now when you now, cause like, I, I mean, we knew each other, but yeah. that was your first 200. And I thought, okay, if we had 10 days mm-hmm. to like get you into camp and if you needed to chill and I'm like, okay, we could do, but I was like so nervous for five days. Yeah. And that like, was like dang. really rugged country too. Extreme didn't you Extreme yeah, rugged cause, country. Cause you said you hadn't taken people back there, I think. Yeah. And so, but yeah, but I mean, we still need to go We're and get this it. figured out. We will, we will get it done. But when you did that 200 though, I mean, I felt like it's just undeniable. Like sure. hundreds hard. Yeah. But 200 mm-hmm. and over two, like I just, I remembered on my end of people and what they said about you. Yeah. It went from like, you know, whatever Cam Haynes, on my end of of like people I'm around, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever Cam, but to like, did you see you ran 200 and something? I was like, like, God dang. Like it's undeniable. (laughs) It's, it's uh, just one of those things. And when you do it multiple times, like, yeah, you people. And so it's like with, you know, people can get luckier. People can push through you know, a hard hunt, get lucky on something, whatever. But when you're constantly doing it or 
the repetitions are producing the same successful outcomes. And you're also showing people that you're, you're enduring doing this hunt, the race, whatever, and you're, you're actually finishing it. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of people can go do one or two things and they fizzle out. Yeah. But just staying involved in, in, in the uh, commitment to it and showing up day in, day out, it's like it's it it's it just comes along the way when you stick with something over time. I you still, know, don't worry, I still have haters. <laughs> what? No way, no way, no way. No, we all but do. I, we I, all do. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. That uh, yeah, telling that story. But yeah, I mean, I do. I still think about. I was telling Tanner. I think that I we were supposed to do a sheep hunt. And I mm-hmm. was like, still one of the regrets I have is not being able to make that happen because, man, I've only killed the one doll. Yeah, and I need to get back up there, and uh, you know, honey sheep is just like it's that is next level. Also, bear, big bear are awesome, but yeah, uh, the sheep with the bow is something special. Sheep, yeah, sheep to me with the bow, I would say is probably the most difficult mm-hmm. to me. Like hunting Alaska sheep with the bow, yeah, is it's very difficult. Those Real sheep deal. are hunted. Yeah. And, you know, by predators, by us. And their eyesight is so good. In bow hunting, you have to be next level to, to do that. And, um, you know, I've had some guys reach out to me and say, hey, yeah, man, I want to book a sheep hunt. And I, you know, okay, well, in bow hunting. Mm-hmm. And, okay, well, what have you what have you done? Like mountain hunting with a bow. Uh, well, I did an elk hunt or I did a, I'm like, okay. All right. I mean, that's fine. We mm-hmm. could potentially go do that, but do you want to like maybe hold off a year or two and go invest and go do another mountain hunt potentially with your bow to learn some things? Perhaps go down to Texas, hunt Audad, a yeah. free range Audad, right? Because that is a excellent bow hunt. It's difficult in a lot mm-hmm. of places. They're extremely difficult to hunt. They're sheep, but it's not like the highest stakes, right? You know, you can still backpack, you can still, you know, uh, you know, you can drive around and go hike, but you're not 10 days backpacked up into a place and, you know, coming to failure on muscular failure, you know, guys wanting to quit. Right. Because they're... The weather's not going to kill you either. Yeah. And so, but, but the point is the repetition, getting on something that is so dialed Mm -hmm. in their you know, their eyes stick out of their head so they can literally see behind them almost. Mm -hmm. Their field of view is so large. And, you know, when you have multiple sheep in a group, there's always something watching and learning how to be patient and sneak one tiny little minuscule movement and then just knowing now's the time and to run forward and draw and kill that thing, you know. Um, And and that takes time and people freeze up and it's heartbreaking to Mm -hmm. watch guys Unlike those sheep hunts that try that, and it, they they find out like, oh boy, this is this is something and like a little bit of that I did really didn't realize. What how are your tough. sheep hunts going for nowadays? I mean, shit's getting expensive. You know, I I don't do a ton of it up there in Alaska, you know, but I'd I'd have to to check on that. But yeah, they're they're anywhere between twenty five to thirty grand. Yeah, you know, and they're same thing in Canada. Some that of them used to be more. the cheaper one, the doll sheep. Yeah, was like yeah, and, and they still are. They still are. Uh, dolls are still the cheapest. In, I mean, unless you draw something down in the States and you're just hiring a guide for, you know, that that's different. But in terms of booking a sheep hunt mm-hmm. and going hunting without drawing something potentially, um, yeah, they're, the dolls are, you know, around 30 and everything else is just skyrocketed. Oh, crazy. It's, crazy. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy how, what they're, what they're at now. A lot of the other sheep hunts, big horns and you know, 50, 60, 70, then same thing with the, uh, stones. And then your deserts can be kind of all over the place depending yeah. on where you're hunting and whatnot. But, but, uh, I, uh, you know, I love hunting sheep. I've been on, uh, most of, I haven't been on a bighorn hunt, I don't believe, mm-hmm. but in terms of like guiding and being mm-hmm. out there, went to Mexico, guided deserts several years, but like, I love sheep hunting, but it, I don't like have the crazy sheep bug yeah. or anything like some people do. Um, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it, but, uh, I, I, man, I put so much stress on myself <laughs> I and I was like, I reached the point where I'm like, I need to kind of 
destressitize myself <laughs> a bunch on certain things, you know, and Dude, and there were hunt. some other writing on the walls. It, it wasn't about the physical nature of things or anything. Mm-hmm. It was like the pressure I put on myself right. to do stuff. And my sheep hunts, I would go with a, with a few other outfitters, and it's, I'm just going and guiding for them and whatnot. So they weren't my areas, mm-hmm. and so uh, so I just try to line guys up in the. You know, if a guy's wanting to do a bow hunt, then we'll go here for bow hunting mm. uh, sheep. But if they're wanting to do a rifle hunt or different physical aspects with it that they're capable of doing, mm-hmm. one place or another, you know. So, but uh, yeah, sheep hunting's a lot of fun, and I do, I do think, you know, I love my goat hunting. I really love goat hunts. That's what I, I do a lot of. But sheep hunting is pretty unmatched when it comes to like distance, especially, mm-hmm. you know, and just. Uh, just the grind, yeah. you know, the sheep hunting grind is real. It's, it's, uh, can be, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty crazy. I've always been, I tell you what, I've been very blessed on all my sheep hunts. Mm. Um, I haven't done a ton of sheep hunts, but I've only had one guy not get a ram over the years and he missed. Mm. And, uh, but just That's because I, I was just so, adamant on sticking with the sheep guys you know didn't always like carrying their camp with them all the time yeah. but i was like man i don't want to leave this thing i gotta i gotta p- watch him every yeah. step he every step he takes and we'll figure out his weak point because some of the guys i'd go with i knew i couldn't hike them all over so yeah. i had to watch that ram for days and uh, wait for the opportunity wait for the opportunity the uh um anna Vorsik was the first um first woman in history to kill a grand slam with a bow yeah and she drew like a tote permit mm. and uh up there in alaska and she's an alaska resident her yeah. husband yeah um she's and, a stud mm-hmm. and so uh they were given the choice to either fly in or hike in mm. and we said if you hike in you may see more more opportunity rather than flying she said yeah let's hike in They're like 20 miles in there and uh, i had her husband i was guiding for um the first six days Six or seven days. Is that Ken? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Ken Borsick. And uh, we were on a ram for six days in a row within 100 yards. Wow. And he was extremely patient. And I'd sneak in there. We, we'd be watching him. And I think we closest we got was maybe 60 yards. And I remember like him walking. And I said, Ken, I think you can sneak up there. You can get up there to, you know, 40. If you, if you go now, you can do it. And he's like, hmm. No, we'll just watch him. And I, I mean, it was killing me. Well, guess what? Uh, Anna's guide got really sick and had to hike out. Yeah. So we were making a plan after that. And he can say, let's take her over there and show her that ram. Because they hadn't been able to get on a ram yet. Yeah. So here we are, day seven or eight, we take her over there. And like first day we get in on that ram and she shoots that ram. Really? So like Ken's patience oh. actually was the blessing. Allowed her to get Allowed it. her to get that ram. Yeah. And she became the first woman in history to shoot wow. a uh, shoot a, uh, her grand slam with a bow. Because she had been on like five other doll sheep hunts oh, or something. Man. And finally got it done. It was like really, it was that was really special. It was I bet. really, really cool to see. She is a stud. I yeah. mean, she was loaded down. I mean, because we were several miles past where our, our camp was there. And so to, to come packing out of that joint, you know, 25 miles oh, with her, gosh. like, super cool. And, I mean, and she was like... That ram right there, see, that right by the door? That's yep. in the toke with Roy. Oh, really? Yeah. Very cool. Dang. Yeah. So you get to, you got to, you went in the toke no, there? No, I did He just shot that one He there. took llamas in there. Because it was serious? it's such a long pack to get back in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, he, that's a nice ram too with the recurve. Dang. Any, I give, I mean, people, you know, in Anchorage or around Alaska, some of these guys go in for sheep with the bow or they draw the archery permit. Yeah, I really want to try to, and I tell all these guys, I'm like, man, I'm all about shooting, you know, big rams and whatever, but you, you've never been on a sheep hunt before mm-hmm. and you're getting ready to go in there with a bow mm-hmm. and you've never even been on a rifle sheep hunt. Just like, because a lot of these archery errors, it, it's like any le- any, any ram is is yeah. legal. I'm like the one I did was any sheep. And it, yeah, right. Yeah. And, and it used to always be any sheep, and then they I think changed it some years back to mm-hmm. any ram now or something. And I tell guys all the time, there was there, one of the Navy SEAL instructors there in Kodiak had a tag this year, and he was going to go by. Him. I'm like, just 
if it's a male mm-hmm. and it and you're within range, I would I would personally take this shot. Yeah. I'm like, you're new to this. Mm-hmm. You're not a professional when it comes to sheep hunting. You, it's it's hard yeah. to sometimes get in close to sheep with a bow. Um, you know, and, and and you have to play it, but you don't just like get up on the first one and whack right. it. But in terms of you know you play it, it out, out, but yeah. it's like some of these guys feel like, uh, I don't want to shoot this younger ram because someone may look down upon. I'm like, yeah, who cares? I know who cares. Yeah. Shoot what if you're excited. If, if it is exciting you, same thing I tell guys with bears, you mm-hmm. know, residents that are going out for the first time or, you know, finally draw a, a Kodiak tag or something. I'm like, hey, man, enjoy yourself out there. Yeah. If you think this may be the only time, don't worry that it's not a 10 footer or nine footer. If it's exciting you and you're in and it trips the trigger for you, that's all that matters. Yeah. Yeah. That's all that matters. OK. It's one thing if you're hiring me or a professional yeah, that's different. A little different. Yeah. Let, let us make that call for you. Mm-hmm. We'll help you get in there. But if you're by yourself, you're with your buddies, like the families, like a lot of talk to a lot of father sons that are going to go out like, hey, man, I've heard a lot of stories of regret from sons not shooting bears with their dads there. And their dad like passed away or it's like, God, I wish I would have shot the bear the yeah. one time I had. But I did. I was just being, you know, I had it in my mind. I wanted to shoot a 10 footer. We just never saw it. But we were on this, you know, eight and yeah. a half or nine footer. And it's like, man. <laughs> Kill the bear. Enjoy your, especially yeah. when you're with family or friends yeah. or something like that. Those are those are good good times and and uh, you know enjoy yourself. Go out mm-hmm. there and make the best of it. Uh, don't worry about what people will think. You know yeah, on how no. big something is. Uh, just I mean, get out there and enjoy yourself. And guess what? When you if you start shooting some sheep, start shooting some bulls, start shooting you know bears, whatever. Yeah. Guess what? Then Ramp it up. then you can start tightening it up a little bit. Yeah. And being a little more specific. Yeah. You know on what you want to hunt. Um, I'm that ram I killed with Roy is like that is the only one I'd killed for many years, and that's any sheep. And I'm like. I, some people did say about, oh, you shot a young one or whatever. It's like, man, th- they give a hundred tags. Sometimes there's one sheep killed. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm not pa- you know, like it, anything is pretty much any ram is Pope and young. So I'm like, it's good enough for me. <laughs> you know, four and a half years old, we'll call it good. Yeah. No. And it's, it's funny because I've, <laughs> buddy of mine drew a tag in there this year. He had a, and I need to find out still how he did, but, uh, um, he uh, he was told by some locals, maybe one guy in an archery shop there, like, oh, yeah, no, no one kills rams in there or whatever. And it's like just discouraging talk. Yeah. And I said, hey, F that guy. <laughs> F that guy yeah. for him telling you that. Like, dude, I went in there and killed a ram. Sure, I was a guy, but I shot a beautiful eight-year-old ram mm-hmm. and just, you know, took my time, did my thing, yeah, had patience, watched the sheep, just got in there was amongst them, watched them for days and then shot one. Yeah. I waited for the right moment. You know, just just get amongst them, as Tom Hoffman says, once yeah. you're amongst them. <laughs> but uh but it's just one of those things where there that is the that permit, you will see guys when I, I remember coming out with a ram. On which one? Uh the October hunt, we were back in Eclutna like Lake? the Eclutna area. Yeah. And I came yeah. out with a guy. We'd been there we had hunted sheep 10 days. We changed locations once, but uh, we were packing out. And I every day we were camped right below the snow line. Then we'd go sit up there for all day in the snow, freezing mm. our nuts off. It's rugged so country, too. Freak- yes. But these sheep would come out of the out of the cliffs, mm. and we would try to make a move on them. And uh, regardless, we finally got this ram that went off and he bedded on this little spine that we could go up and around and uh finally got in there my hunter shot this thing 50 yards killed this ram right before dark and i was like oh my god thank god and uh it was my first archery ram Mm. and uh that i was guided ever and so i was like you know really thankful to get it done but we were just so cold and when we came out the next day um, uh, we got out there to the truck and here's a couple guys, you know, offloading four wheelers and, you know, some rubber boots and, uh, and this dude had a recurve and I was like, he goes, Oh, you guys got a Ram? I said, yeah, yeah. And, uh, he said, Oh, right on. Was there a lot of them? I said, there's a few up there. Yeah, there's enough. 
cool. I said, are you moose hunting? He goes, nope, nope. Going to go up there sheep hunt for the day. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, we just hi- we just came off like 4,000 feet. Yeah. And this dude's got muck boots on, sweatpants, <laughs> like some camo sweatpants and, you know, a little day bag, a recurve and four wheeling up in there. And it's already like, you know, midday. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, are you camping? Nope. Just going to go up there and look. And so that's what, there, there's a lot of those guys that yeah. do that or get to that point and they're not going to go to the next right. level. But then there's also a lot of killers that are locals up there that know what yeah. the heck they're doing. But my point is, just like a lot of places, no, not everyone goes the extra mile. Mm-hmm. They're going to draw the permit. A lot of them, some people won't show up. Yeah. And, and some people will go the first mile, but they won't go mile five, six, seven, eight, or 20 mm-hmm. where you really need to go. Yeah. You know, but they have that opportunity to go out hunting. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the reason why they give out probably 100 permits. Right. But you're right. It's There's some years there's one or two, and I think the year I killed my ram in there was, uh, I think there was two or three killed mm-hmm. out of all those those permits. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. <laughs> but, but, you know, it's just one of those things of, uh, you know, it's funny. If, you, if you're if you pushing hard in your bow hunting, like if I'm rifle guiding, I'm struggling to get within 350 to 400 yards, mm-hmm. right? But if I'm bow hunting, I'm yeah. in that hundred yard range <laughs> all, the all the time, struggling to get within, you know, yeah. what what because it's yeah, yeah, to, for for a bow shot, you know, I, it's one thing if if you're by yourself, but man, when I'm guiding, guys, I it gives, I'm a little nervous when with with guys that want to shoot like that can shoot far, yeah, just because I've seen so many things I and, I, and I'm so I'm just like, oh man, just I just gotta get a little closer, yeah, gotta get a little closer. I know everybody, <laughs> everybody thinks they can shoot at eighty. Until they get out there and it's on a on an animal, super steep. Uh, you know the oh, other yeah. the other thing is, and that, that's the fun thing about like going to those total archery challenges, mm-hmm. is it is expo- it exposes a lot of things. Yeah, like a definitely. lot of people don't check their bubble when they yeah. get on a steep terrain, oh, no. and they're just trying to focus on everything else, and uh, and that exposes that. So you can have those conversations when you're on the mountainside shooting with your buddies, you know, at that foam. Yeah, that like. Oh wow! Why did you shoot so far to the right or left? Yeah, and it's you like, look at that level. Yeah, yeah, you didn't look at that bubble, did you? Yeah. And, uh, and a lot canteen. of guys, their or their third axis is off. Yes, a hundred percent. Yep. All the yeah. That's what Wayne's good at checking too, because they put on that hooter shooter and put it at the angles. And a lot of guys, they're. I mean, even if you do everything perfect, you're a foot off because your third axis axis is off. <sighs> yeah. So. Yep. It is. That is one thing that. Uh, yeah, it's always very, very interesting. Uh, this year on a on a goat hunt, I was I, I wasn't guiding this one, but the outfitter I worked with was was talking, and he goes, "Man, strike one, strike two, he's missed it. You know, thirty yards, forty yards, missed or fifty. And I said, missing high, low, left, right, way left, way right. I go, okay, <laughs> tell him to check his bubble, yeah. and then he finally <laughs> shot one the next day. But it was just, whoops. But guys, they they forget that on that stuff. Well, and also there's something about sheep because I know I, you know, you probably know these guys, but, uh, there's guys in Colorado and they had the sheep hunter and he was just missed at 25, 30, 51, mm-hmm. threw his bow, broke his bow, threw it off the mountain, <laughs> went and got a new bow, came back with a brand new Matthews all dialed in with everything and then missed three more times. <laughs> so mm. it's just sheep. You know, obviously it wasn't the bow. So people get the sheep fever oh, thing yeah. because the stakes are so freaking high yep. on a ram. It's like a lot, it's once in a lifetime for a lot of people. Yeah. I would say bears and sheep mm-hmm. will do that. Yeah. Goats will do it for the steep terrain. Mm-hmm. I've had guys, they don't get too, I mean, God, they may get a little nervous with a shot because the animal, but it's mainly the terrain where they'll shut down right. on steep terrain for goats. Yeah. But the bear and sheep, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's different, and like like say with bears, you just see them do stuff that you, you you're like, hey, yeah, hey, 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 snap out of it, <laughs> come you back. know, or guys will be at full draw and the bears running away, and I'll say, no, 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 and yeah. I have to like literally grab them, right, so they don't shoot at this bear running away, <sighs> yeah, and but they they're so make crazy decisions, yeah, make some different decisions, it's and they don't just, really always understand that they're doing it, yeah, and that, so that's obviously part of our adrenaline. job, yeah. yeah, it's uh. It's not easy for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Well, Cole, thank you. This has been an awesome, a long time coming. I've been wanting to sit down and talk with you and share stories for years. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, man, I just appreciate everything that you offer the, the hunting industry and how you help so many people and just the way you carry yourself. It's, uh, it's I mean, I got a lot, a lot of respect for you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it goes the same to you. We appreciate you and all you do and how you respect this community and everything. So, and congratulations to both your sons and, uh, and Trude on that, uh, <laughs> world record. Yeah. 8,100 pull-ups. Very I, impressive. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, you did a great job. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, sir. It's been good. Appreciate you. Thank you. Hey guys, it's Cameron Haynes here. I'm going to be giving away this brand new Ford Raptor 2023 fully loaded badass truck. You got 20 inch wheels, 35 inch tires. The tax man loves coming for that money, right? I'm giving away 10,000 cash to offset that for the winner. You get a truck and 10,000 in cash. I want you to win this brand new 2023 Ford Raptor. Enter to win, CameronHaynes.com. Keep hammering. Every time they tell me stop, I use every comment, hate that makes my feel gather up my energy and boom. I hear them talking, saying the way that I move is so reckless. That is a part of my mind I've been blessed with, giving my blood so I am relentless. My fault, they want someone to blame. They sent the hate, it fuels my pace. I am Roy Tough, I am the change, the few endure. Feeling like Cam Haynes.